So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or BIDS, has been the country's foremost socioeconomic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERPI widget, or type surf-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Therapy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication, and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. 
sinusulo ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng polisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag polisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information, created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget, or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes. Labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit SERPI now! Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahin problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. Iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan muna gusto ng government. Two things. 
clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies, o PIDS, na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiya ang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making ipang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is the PIDS webinar series where we feature PIDS policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila C.R., and I will be your moderator. 
FinTech, which is short for financial technology, is a rising industry in the Philippines. It has been around for decades, but over the past few years and with the COVID-19 pandemic that has forced people to shift to online services, the fintech industry has seen a significant increase in revenue and activity. For our webinar this afternoon, we will take a closer look at the country's fintech landscape. We will examine its players and, stakeho and stakeholders, its trends and weaknesses, as well as opportunities and risks. We'll also discuss how to move the fintech industry forward in a sustainable and inclusive direction. To officially open our virtual event and give us more information about today's topic, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Aniseto Arbeta Jr. Sir? Good, af good afternoon. Uh, let me start by acknowledging the presence of the following. From the government, we have uh, Department of Information and Communications Technology Assistant Secretary Christopher Tiansai and uh, Director Antonio Eduard Padre from the Department of Interior and Local Government Assistant Secretary uh, Esther Aldana, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, Commissioner Kelvin Lester Lee, Director Rachel Esther Gumantang Rimalante, Vicente Graciano Feliz Minio. Assistant Director Sridhpa Papisio, Kenneth Joy Kemio, and Archibald Navarro. Government and Insurance uh, System Senior Vice President Raquel de Guzman Buinsalida, House of Representatives Congressional Policy and Budget uh, Research Department Socioeconomic Research Bureau Executive Director Manuel Aquino, Department of Science and Technology Food and Nutrition Research Institute Director and Scientist Emilda Agdipa and uh, Deusti Caraga, Assistant Regional Director Ricardo Valera, Banco Central ng Pilipinas Directors Laura Ignacio and Eloisa Glindro, and Deputy Director Marian Santos, Board of Investments Director Sandra Maria Ricolisado, and Philippine Competitions Commission's Director Benjamin Rado. From the private sector, we have Isla Impact Ventures founder and Chief Executive Officer Jennifer Viloria, RISPH Consulting founder Johnny Paul Lagura, uh, Altnet Corporation Chief Executive Officer Ernie Don, uh, Don Don Bacal, uh, In One Go Technologies Incorporated President Ramon Garcia, uh, Technology Incorporated Vice President Joseph Garde Garganira. St. Luke Medical Center's uh, Senior Vice President Alvin Marcelo, and Bank of the Philippine Islands Assistant Vice President Christine Lovely Red. From the academy, let me acknowledge uh, the following Asian uh, Institute of Management Associate Director and Senior Economist John Paul Plaminiano, uh, Northern Iloilo Polytechnic uh, State College Batad Campus Associate Director Eva Montero, University of the Philippines Birata School of Economics Dean uh, Joel Tan Torres, uh, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Dean uh, Lual Hati Dilakos. From the CSOs, NGOs, and INGOs, we have the World Bank Financial Sector Coordinator for the Philippines, Isako Indo, and FinTech Alliance uh, PH Chairman Lito Villanueva, Masaganang um, Sakahan Incorporated Director Daniel Agustin. Let me also greet our friends from the media. Finally, let me also greet our guests, colleagues from government, academy, civil service, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS and SERP Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar. Our topic today uh, highlights one of the industries that have been gaining more prominence lately, the financial technology or fintech industry. The mobility restrictions caused uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic have resulted in continuous growth of the fintech industry globally. In fact, data from the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker showed that fintech markets have a 50% higher growth rate in countries with more stringent COVID-19 measures compared to those with less uh, severe uh, responses. This is also true for the Philippines, where uh, digital payment platforms have significantly increased since the start of the pandemic. During the 2020 annual public policy conference on the theme Bouncing Back Together, Innovating Governance for the New Normal, organized by PIDS, 
a panelist from Banco Central ng Pilipinas or BSP, shared that they, uh, they observe a growing preference for digital transactions among Filipinos as they are seen as safer and convenient ways in payment, uh, making payments and transferring funds. In particular, the BSP saw the noticeable increase in the use of online payment transactions for the first and second quarter of 2020. It also marked an increase in the volume of eco pay transactions, the facility that digitized government collections and disbursements for taxes, licenses, permits, and other obligations to the government of about 688% since its launch in November 2019. In addition, more recent reports have shown that 5,000% 5, increase in the volume of eco pay transactions in May of last year. These trends only show that fintech industry can help the country achieve its development goals, particularly in uh, strengthening the effectiveness of financial inclusion initiatives. Thus, it is essential that we better understand this industry. This afternoon, we will feature the PIDS study uh, analysis of the fintech uh, landscape of, in the Philippines, authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Francis Mark Kimba, uh, so, uh, Supervising uh, Research Specialist Mark Anthony Baral, and uh, Philippine APIC Center Study Network uh, Center Network Project Evaluation Officer uh, Jean uh, Clarice uh, T. Carlos. It looked into the state of the country's fintech industry and investigated how the government and other stakeholders can support the development of its ecosystem. We have also invited uh, representatives from the various stakeholders closely involved in the fintech industry. Joining us this afternoon are Mr. Kevin Gabayan, the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Plitina, a fintech startup that aims to accelerate credit access in the emerging markets. Ms. Amor Maklang, Trustee and Executive Director of the Fintech Philippines Association, and Ms. Uh, Jovelyn Hau, uh, Acting Group Head of the BSB Fintech Innovation and Policy Research Group. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I look forward to hearing your insights about this topic. I want to end uh, by thanking all of you for your attendance in this, today's seminars and your participation in the forum, uh, the open forum uh, later is highly encouraged. I now give back the floor to the moderator. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Obeta. So friends, at this point, I now uh, invite all of you to uh, pay attention to our featured uh, presentation for this webinar, which as mentioned by uh, Dr. Um, Orbeta is uh, the study, it's a study on uh, the analysis of uh, the fintech uh, landscape in the Philippines, authored by Dr. Francis uh, Markimba, um, Mr. Anthony uh, Baral, and Ms. Uh, Jean uh, Carlos. The presentation will be uh, delivered by uh, Dr. Kimba, who is a senior research fellow at PIDS and director of the Philippine Apex Study Center Network. He has worked on a number of uh, research topics, including trade, uh, competition and innovation. And his current research interest is the innovation activity of local firms as well as uh, regional integration issues. He has participated in uh, roundtable discussions on trade, industrial development, innovation, and e-commerce. Dr. Kimba obtained his master's in uh, international development from the International University of Japan, and uh, he obtained another uh, master's degree in uh, his PhD in Development Economics from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan. I now give you Dr. Kimba for his presentation. Francis, the floor is now yours. I can see it on my screen. Yes, it's okay. We can see it, Francis. All right. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, so, uh, today, I'm, as I as mentioned earlier, it's a, a joint work with uh, PIDS colleagues, Mark and Jean, and we are going to talk about the uh, fintech landscape in, in the Philippines. 
So just an introduction, fintech in the Philippines have been gaining more traction in recent years, heightened by the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've mentioned that the, the mobility restrictions are actually the ones that are pushing uh, this um, uh, uh, industry forward. You know? So exponential, we've seen exponential growth in digital payments and that have uh, encouraged more bank and non-bank financial services to enter the market, providing diversified financial products and services. However, despite such developments, the industry's financial inclusion remains uh, lagging behind our ASEAN neighbors. And uh, simultaneously, issues on reliability of systems and consistency of regulations are beginning to emerge. So this paper, um, maybe just to give you a, a, a preview of what we are, it's going to be discussed. So what we have seen is that uh, an increasing no there's an increasing number of fintechs uh, in the country, particularly in um, the uh, verticals of payments, lendings, and um, banking technology. And uh, we've also seen some increasing capitalization entering the market. The fintech industry can support the country's goals of financial inclusion, but there needs to be an improvement in certain areas, especially, especially in terms of talent and uh, credit uh, for the sector. So, um, so first is uh, why why do we have to study this uh, sector? Although we've you've seen, uh, we've heard from uh, Dr. Orbeta already uh, why we're doing uh, an analysis of this sector. But just to expound on that, so despite the COVID-19 pandemic, which has disrupted the uh, traditional business models and uh, rearranged economic structures, fintechs continue to grow rapidly and uh, massively. So the market, market rapid assessment in 2020 showed that fintech firms reported a year-on-year -year average increase of 13% uh, in the number of transactions and 11% in transaction volumes in the first uh, two quarters of uh, 2021. Uh, Dr. Urbeta has mentioned that uh, from the uh, Oxford's COVID-19 government response tracker, uh, fintech transaction volume in high stringency markets. So these are the markets where, um, you know, um, similar to what we have uh, implemented, you know, the, the, the lockdowns have been implemented. So in these types of markets, 50% um, um, fintech uh, volume grew by 50% uh, higher than countries with less stringent uh, COVID-19 response. So this trend is most evident uh, for digital payments that grew 29% uh, in high stringency jurisdictions. So we see the value of fintech uh, as a response for COVID-19. But in addition to that, fintech may help improve the efficiency of financial services and address economic and social issues. As the use of fintech, uh, as the use of digital payment platforms sharply increased during the pandemic, it has implications on the role of fintech in achieving the country's uh, development goals, which is enshrined in our uh, Philippine Development Plan 2016 to 2022, in, especially in the strategy of strengthening the effectiveness of financial inclusion initiatives by focusing on the efficient delivery of microfinance and microinsurance products for Filipinos, including those living abroad. However, concerns on the use of cryptocurrency and initial currency offerings are recently also surfacing. As these products can potentially make laws and regulations ineffective, particularly against illegal activities and cross-border capital flows, such as money laundering. This therefore poses some regulatory challenges, but also gives more weight to the importance of accurate and timely policies. And finally, regulatory frameworks need to be crafted carefully as it may not only inspire innovation and improvement, but if uh, applied um, wrongly, it can potentially dissuade and result in instability. So before we continue on, I, I think it's uh, it would be good if we provide a definition of fintech or what do we, what exactly are we talking about when we say fintech? So fintech, um, are, can be defined as advances in technology and changes in business models 
that have potential to transform the provision of financial services through the development of innovative instruments, channels, and systems. Therefore, fintechs are seen to transform the financial industry by three things. No? So reducing the costs of providing the services, improving the quality and variety of financial services and products, and third is to establish a more stable uh, financial sector. But for the Philippines, there, there is no official definition of fintech, something that is enshrined in law. As such, the lack of a formal definition provided by law or policy makes it difficult in obtaining official indicators on the performance of the sector. However, there are still several documents that are assessing the, finance, the fintech sector, which can be the foundation for a definition in the country. So the Fintech Alliance of the Philippines considers fintech as the financial services that are deployed through the internet and or the mobile applications. These are usually characterized by more user-friendly interfaces, greater efficiency, transparency, and higher levels of automation than those offered by more the traditional institutions. Uh, similarly, um, in the presentation made by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Javier uh, used the definition of the Financial Stability Board that defines fintechs as technology-enabled innovation in financial services that could result in new businesses, new business models, application processes, or products with associated material effects and the provision of financial services. For these financial services, the adoption of technological innovations brings about improvements in operational efficiency, enhanced customer experiences, and more decisive competitive advantage. And finally, one of the more uh, most recent definitions that's uh, on fintech is provided by the Financial Sector Forum, which defines fintech as software, a service, or a business that provides technologically advanced ways to make financial processes and transactions more efficient compared to the traditional method. And this is actually the, this the dev, is the definition, includes specific descriptions of activities that would be covered by fintechs. And uh, I think this is the most recent one that can be applied by the Philippines to, as a foundation for a definition of, of fintech. Um, but I, I think I, I, it's important to say that the, the, the common denominator there is the application of technology, as you can see from all uh, three uh, definitions, no? and the disruption that this causes. So uh, for this study, for this paper, we are actually applying a very simple uh, conceptual framework that we have adopted from uh, previous studies that have looked also into the fintech uh, uh, ecosystem in uh, in other uh, jurisdictions in other countries. So uh, some of uh, in the UK and in the US. So a number of uh, conceptual frameworks have been developed to describe the fintech ecosystem. So in a framework used to describe the UK's fintech ecosystem, the model in, um, identified uh, four attributes that support a well-functioning system. So namely its talent pool, the availability of capital, the policy environment, and the demand for fintech services. And in the middle of all these things is, of course, the set of uh, fintechs uh, in the country. So to describe the fintech landscape, the, we, we present indicators for each of these aspects using um, secondary data that we've gathered. As, because as I've mentioned, there's no formal definition. And so data is uh, actually a bit limited for, uh, for understanding the, the entire uh, ecosystem. And let me just tell you where we're sourcing our data. So for fintech companies, the one in the middle, database um, containing, um, we've con constructed a database containing lists of platforms, fintech reports, and SEC registered institutions. For talent and uh, academe, um, we looked at indicators on Filipino labor force from the Philippine Statistics Authority and the IMD, IMD World Competitiveness Report. For demand for fintech, We've sourced uh, our information from BSP's Financial Inclusion Survey and for the Financial um, Inclusion Database of BSP, which contains a demand for fintech and key statistics um, regarding consumers and users of financial services. We've also uh, um, conducted key informant interviews to verify our findings and provided the research uh, 
provided us with uh, first-hand information, the experiences of fintech companies and businesses in the country. So let me now just describe the fintech uh, ecosystem by looking at uh, general trends in, in the country. So for the Philippines, fintech is a very promising as the country has been identified as one of the fast growing fintech destinations as evidenced by new fintech companies that were being created annually. From 2010 to 2018, uh, 2014 was the year with the most fintech companies that were created with a total of 34 new fintech companies. The number of companies created each year since then has dropped steadily with 2018 registering only nine new fintech companies. Investment, however, continued to increase exponentially from 2016 to 2018 at the rate of 762.5%. The employment in these companies have not been reported, but the employment in business and IT-related industries can be used as a somehow a close proxy uh, of employment. And the uh, data from PSA seems to show that the employment in these sectors have not changed significantly since 2014. In 2017, there were 1,268 fintechs in ASEAN, and this is based on um, the ASEAN fintech census. Singapore has the highest concentration, followed by Indonesia. The Philippines had only one had only 115, placing it behind um, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. According to the latest report of BSP, however, the number of fintechs in the country is already 212 as of December 2020, mostly involved in payments, lending, e-wallets, remittances, e-commerce, insurance investments, and even in regulatory technologies. An increase of about uh, 46%. In terms of the value of investments in fintech, Singapore again topped the 27 in 2017 with a total investments of 141 million US dollars. Well, the Philippines came in next with 78 million US dollars, followed closely by Malaysia with 75 million US dollars. Now looking at another source of uh, information, data according to the Global Fintech Index 2020 suggests that the um, Philippines is among the list of countries to watch across the globe, at least it's one of the fastest growing fintech destinations. This is because it has a much higher fintech index ranking than their global startup scores. So as a subset of the global startups, fintechs are rising faster. Ranking the cities in ASEAN for 2021, the index found that Singapore leads the region with 226 fintechs, followed by Indonesia with 88. For the Philippines, the global fintech index found 183 fintechs, placing it third. And um, Okay, um, so, and based on the 2020 rankings, the Global Fintech Index report that um, identified the Philippines and Vietnam as among the countries to watch out for because of its rapidly um, increasing uh, fintech scores. So the strengths of the Philippines are in payments, enabling processes and technology, and uh, banking and lending. So let's expound again. Uh, so who are these uh, fintech players specifically. So in where do where can we find them? The Philippine Fintech Startup Report 2017, released in September 2017 by Fintech Singapore or Singapore Fintech Association, categorized 60 Philippine fintech startups into six categories. So again, so that's payments, alternative finance, remittances, comparison portals, credit rating and analytics, and payroll or HR. Majority of which are engaged in payments which provides mobile commerce and payment services, including e-wallet or digital wallet providers. Alternative financing fintechs also comprise a large share of fintechs, and these include uh, providers of digital loans, micro loans, online pawn shops, and other lending and credit related services, as well as crowdfunding, one-stop loan solutions, and shop now pay later services. Others are engrossed in uh, remittance fintechs, which facilitate international and domestic money transfers including Bitcoin transfer or exchange. Comparison portals provide analytics comparing products and services suitable for the needs of the consumers, while credit rating and analytics provide solutions to, um, asset, to assess the credit worthiness of individuals. And analytics related to investment decisions, transactions, and investment flows. 
A fraction of the ecosystem are uh, payrolls or the HR fintechs, which provide uh, HR solutions such as web and mobile application dashboards that consolidate bills, payments, healthcare, insurance, business tools, time and attendance, and end-to-end um, uh, -end payroll solutions, disbursements, computation of taxes and savings. The following year, in 2018, the report identified a total of 126 startups categorized into mobile payments and wallets, remittances, credit scoring, comparison, and additional categories for investment in blockchain and or cryptocurrency. Investment fintech uh, facilitates um, stock market investments, trading competition and collaboration. This uh, sector includes a platform uh, in, or platforms that allow investment using Bitcoin and access to global capital markets. Digital financial advisor, stock picking and portfolio management, and even mutual funds investment. Meanwhile, InsureTech, so uh, you can see there there's, there's one, um, includes a mobile insurance platform and uh, budget dependent insurance options and micro insurance coverage. So um, the, the variety of uh, fintech services has, has also been expanding. So not just the number of fintechs. So now in 2020, so from a list of SEC registered companies identified to engage in fintech activities, most of the companies in 2020 are into the issuance of virtual currencies, remittance, credit and finance, and lending. Companies engaged in currency exchange and other companies supervised by the BSP follow a little behind. So another source of uh, uh, on the fintech ecosystem of the Philippines, the Global Fintech Index by Fintechable. So Fintechable listed a total of 170 fintechs in the Philippines in 2020, and this increased and this increased slightly from to 183 in 2021. So among the verticals or sectors, lending and marketplaces fintechs, 34 uh, percent and payment and transfers fintechs 31 percent dominate the industry this trend remains the same in 2021 although the shares have declined slightly in 2021 banking technology infrastructure and automation increased sharply from 2020 and this is possibly because of the bsp's policy related to digital banks although we haven't really tested the, that hypothesis the increasing number of fintechs in the Philippines and the increasing number of verticals not only indicate an evolving fintech sector, but also indicate a diversifying industry in the country. So now let's just look at the other components. Let's look at the demand. So demand for fintech look at three aspects. How much local market consumers have adopted fintech, how much businesses demand fintech, and the demand of the financial institutions for fintech services. So for consumers, Filipinos are still reliant on traditional financial institutions for access to financial services. In 2019, among the financial access points or institutions where people obtain financial services or make financial transactions, Filipinos are most aware of ATMs, 90%, pawn shops, 82%, and banks, 77%. One of the strengths that the industry can rely on is on the growing participation of consumers in electronic money transactions. So from 2018 to 2019 alone, e-money transactions increased by 36% from 1.09 to 1.5 trillion pesos. Active e-money accounts, on the other hand, increased by 76%. For businesses, in the Philippines, individual demand also dominates 43%. However, the demand from the corporate sector is much larger, 32%, than the demand for SMEs, 19% which may have implications on equity as benefits from the technology could accrue to larger corporations while SMEs would lag behind. The demand for fintech services by companies would be related to their openness to utilize digital technology in their business and transactions. So according to, excuse me, <coughs> according to the IMD uh, World Competitive Index in 2021, Corporate interest in digital transformation in the Philippines has deteriorated since 2017. The Philippines has fallen significantly behind its ASEAN neighbors in 2021 regarding the trans transformation of companies. The country also has the lowest usage of big data and analytics. 
And these are the foundations actually of uh, some fintech services. How about the demand of financial institutions? Data on the demand of financial institutions for fintech services are limited, but information on their participation in digital payments can be proxied by the number of banks participating in the National Retail Payment System, or the NRPS. As more banks participate in the NRPS, the ease of conducting banking and financial transactions increases. As of October 2021, there have been 90 peso net participants composed of 42 universal commercial banks, 17 thrift banks, 27 rural banks, and four e-money users. And there is room for expansion in the QR P2P participants and the P2M uh, participants. How about the availability of capital? <clears throat> Excuse me. The availability of capital ensures that fintechs, which are often startups and scale-ups, can fund the expansion of their operations. Using data on investment deals in uh, the fintech sector from PitchBook Data Inc., a, a private data uh, provider, Corneli et al. in 2021 analyzed the sources of funding of fintechs all over the world and found that a rapidly increasing trend in terms of investments in fintech over the last decade. This can be observed in terms of both the number and value of deals. For the Philippines, the number of fintech deals has been increasing since 2010 until 2016 when it reached a peak of 15 fundraising deals. Since 2016, the number of deals has been declining steadily with a slight rebound in 2020. However, it is worth noting that the value of these fundraising deals have also been increasing steadily. Venture capital, VC, is also seen as an important source of funding <coughs> excuse me, for fintechs in the Philippines. Excuse me. <coughs> When asked if there is a need for more venture capitalists for fintech firms, 87% of fintech respondents from the Philippines mentioned that there is a need for more VCs. In contrast, the proportion is only 67% for Thailand and Vietnam and 37% for Indonesia, according to the ASEAN Fintech Census. Google, Temasek, and Bain 2021 have found, have found that the first half of 2021, confidence of investors has seen <coughs> a resurgence as indicated by an uptick in deal-making and deal activity. The report is optimistic that investment in digital services is on track to hit the highest record in recent years, as the first half of 2021 has already surpassed the value of deals in 2020. In addition, health tech and egg tech also saw significant um, funding activity in the Philippines as players turned towards the second largest market in the region for future growth. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> to continue, uh, let's look at the talent formation and the role of academia. One of the requirements of the fintech industry to grow and sustain its progress is the availability of competent, talented, and skilled workers and entrepreneurs. Thus, continuous formation of skills for all individuals to fill in the demands in fintech is an important aspect of talent formation. In the country, enrollment in fintech-related disciplines such as business administration and information technology <clears throat> have fluctuated over the years. Huge drops in enrollment in, in these areas have, experienced, have been experienced in academic years 2016 to 2017 and 2017 to 2018. But enrollment has recovered in 2018 to 2019 and since to be sustained since then. Business administration courses are important to the sector as these develop business skills. 
data for graduates of business and technology related courses, however, show that there might be a limited supply of fintech talent available in the country that can support the financial services industry in adopting emerging technologies. Okay, so relative to other uh, countries in ASEAN, the performance of the country varies across types of fintech relevant aspects. Regarding the availability of digital or technological skills in the labor force, the country scored 7.23 in 2016, following Singapore's 8.52 and Malaysia's 7.63. Unfortunately, the trend has been decreasing since 2016, with the 2020 score of the country being 6.27. This puts the country last among the five ASEAN countries that have data in the survey. The country, however, is performing well in terms of availability of skilled labor. Since 2016, the Philippines has consistently scored above 6.7 in this aspect, but in 2020, Singapore overtook the Philippines as its score slipped to 6.62. The role of the academe in the formation of talents and skilled individuals is very important for the growth of the fintech industry. In the Philippines, there are a number of higher value institutions, higher educational institutions offering degrees related to fintech and IT related. Very few, if none, however, are directly dedicated to fintech. Two of the country's top universities initiated activities that could address the demand in the industry. One is the Ateneo de Manila University that has set up the first university-based blockchain lab in the country. This, however, has been put on hold indefinitely. The other is the University of the Philippines with its Junior Finance Association and in partnership with the Union Bank of the Philippines FinTech Group, which organized a FinTech immersion program for finance students. Finally, the role of government. Now, looking at the role of the government, the BSP, SEC, and the Insurance Commission directly supervise the FinTech industry. The BSP is mandated to create a supportive environment for financial inclusion. On the other hand, the SEC regulates the lending and other financial industries, while the IC uh, regulates and guides the insurance, pre-need, and home maintenance organizations. Other relevant agencies, AMLAC, the ICT, NPC, and TC, also regulate the fintech industries on matters concerning data privacy, security, money laundering, and other and information systems. Given the various entities regulating the sector, the Financial Sector Forum was created as a formalized um, framework for coordination composed of the BSP, SEC, PDIC, and Insurance Commission. The forum aims to provide an institutionalized regulatory framework for coordinating this and the supervision and regulation of the financial system, facilitate consultation and the exchange of information and ideas among regulators, and provide a platform to harmonize the regulation of financial products offered by the various types of financial institutions. In terms of supporting the innovation, infrastructure, and promotion, the BSP launched the National Retail Payment System to foster uh, digital payments and support the growth of fintechs. The NRPS promotes, among others, interoperability. The state when end users or consumers are able to transfer funds from one account to another account in any participating BSP supervised financial institution. By enabling interoperability, sustained adoption of electronic payments is possible as electronic transactions are made more convenient. NRPS likewise facilitates and supports the delivery of a wide range of financial products that cater to the need of all users. In addition, the BSP has also issued other policies such as on the regulation of VASPS and the venture capitals and the guidelines on e-commerce and digital applications. The BSP also encouraged financial institutions to lend to MSMEs as well as implemented a regulatory standbox to bring together fintech stakeholders. The Philippine government is in support of emerging industries through the Philippine Innovation Act of 2019, or RA 11293, which promotes the diffusion of knowledge as a driver of national development 
and provides technical and financial support for scaling up and marketization of industries. So now let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of the fintech industry. The industry can rely on the the, the industry can rely on these strengths. First is the growing participation in e-money transactions. So from 2018 to 2019 alone, e-money transactions have posted 36% growth rate, while e-money accounts have grown 76%. So opportunities are abundant with the incessant and increasing financial needs and behaviors of the people. There's also an increased access to technology. So as technologies serve as access points for consumers, it is advantageous that more people are gaining access to technologies. Access to smartphones and the internet allow users to get acquainted with digital financial products and services. There's also a growing number of mobile phones and internet users. The number of mobile phone and internet users continue to grow annually, which presents an opportunity for the fintech industry to penetrate a potential market. There's uh, progressive and uh, coordinated uh, government regulators. Regulators are generally receptive to the introduction of the Philippines to the introduction in the Philippines of fintech products and services that have been introduced in many other countries subject to the regulators imposition of certain conditions for the protection of the public and uh, open and supportive uh, regulatory environment the open and supportive regulatory environment of the fintech sector can be considered as a strength the regu regulatory sandboxes for fintech and insure tech allows for innovation in the delivery of digital financial services without sacrificing security of the market. On the other hand, the sector is troubled with the following weaknesses. So there are issues arising from access points and distrust from using technologies. Of the total number of Filipino adults who transacted with access points in 2019, 37% encountered issues, significantly larger than those encountered issues in 2017 which is only about 6%. Although 84% of the issues encountered are resolved, a noticeable 16% are not resolved, as many are not aware what, that the regulators can be contacted or wish to avoid the hassle. There's also a lack of awareness and the usage of technologies for financial transactions. So despite an increasing number of Filipinos owning mobile phones and having access to the internet, most are not aware how to utilize such for financial transactions. There's poor connectivity and high cost of internet, and unreliable internet connection discourages users from transacting digitally. Preference for cash transactions due to lack of trust is also a weakness. We have also seen gaps in policy and regulatory environment. So lack of formal regulations or, and definitions affects prospective fintech players as approval of fintech services are solely reliant on regulators. Imposition of out-of-date policies of, on the new sector, for example, the archaic policies such as the provisions in Presidential Decree Number uh, 1718 imposed on the new sector are disadvantageous. How about some opportunities and threats? So in terms of opportunities, relatively open digital environment for integration with other countries in the region, as can, can be seen in a different paper that we have released last year. There's also a sustained use of digital payments and fintechs after the onset of the pandemic. So with restrictions to, the, to mobility, the country was forced to adopt new methods of doing things. So the use of online marketplaces and e-money for purchasing items has significantly increased, thus this serves as a catalyst for the industry to develop faster than anticipated prior to the pandemic. And uh, it, it is sustained, actually, it's sustained even after the pandemic. So there are also incentives and support from the government. So various tax incentives provided by the government to SMEs on the onset of the pandemic have stimulated companies to recalibrate and move their timelines to avail of such incentives. The creation of a national center for AI research. So, for example, various initiatives have been undertaken, uh, one of which is the e-commerce roadmap and then the artificial intelligence roadmap. And central to the AI roadmap is the creation of a national center for AI research that houses full-time scientists, research engineers, 
which can support the AI competitiveness of the country and in turn um, be used as a foundation for um, fintech uh, growth and development. On the other hand, there are several threats that may hamper the growth of the sector, such as limited venture capital available to support the growth of startups, and also the lack of digital and technological talent. Recognizing that the right skills are crucial to the adoption of new technologies, the industry has expressed concern regarding the lack of digital and technological talent. There's also a need for detailed and systematic sources of information, so the lack of statistics in the sector prevents an thorough assessment of its progress. <clears throat> Competition from other ASEAN nations. So neighboring countries are positioning themselves as fintech hubs in the region. So aside from in Singapore, there's Indonesia and Vietnam, and they're already organizing themselves as the next fintech powerhouse in the region. So given these uh, SWOT, given this SWOT, this study finds that the Philippines has a strong fintech industry, as indicated by the number of fintechs, as well as an uh, increasing um, capitalization. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought about significant increase in demand for digital services, and various studies note that the adoption of digital technology will be sustained in the coming years. However, several issues remain at hand that must be addressed in order for the sector to fully flourish. So just some uh, final words and recommendations. So despite having um, indications of a strong fintech industry, the ecosystem still needs to be strengthened for the sector to fully thrive. In particular, interventions and initiatives could focus on first, reviewing the policies and regulations. So especially the ones that are already archaic. While the sector benefits from a well-coordinated and forward-looking uh, set of regulators, Policies and laws must be revisited and reviewed. It is imperative to have a policy on fintech that would define and monitor the progress of the sector. The development of Philippine skills framework. As human capital is essential to the rapid growth of the fintech industry, it's high time for the government and academic institutions to revisit concern, um, policies concerning higher education institutions and update the curriculum to make graduates more competent. Collaboration among government, industry, and academic community to develop skills framework that would support the upskilling and reskilling of the country's workers for their particular job roles. Third, uh, the next administration and the Philippine Development Plan. In crafting for its next Philippine Development Plan, the incoming administration must address issues in the use of fintech among Filipinos, specifically in areas concerning education, information, dissemination, Improvements in ICT access and enabling environment for fintech players, inclusivity across regions and uh, rural areas in the protection of data privacy and security, and others. So um, the government must ensure there's a uh, fair playing field for new entrants to participate and uh, penetrate uh, the market. So the, this is the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And thank you very much, Francis. So we'll give you um, some time to rest. I know it has been uh, difficult for you. So thank you very much. We uh, laud your tenacity to uh, finish the, the presentation. We'll hear more from Francis during the open forum. Okay, friends, uh, let us continue the uh, conversation. And uh, this time we will hear from our invited experts on their comments and insights okay so uh let's start with our um uh fintech companies which visibly are uh, driving the industry and we are honored to uh, have with us today mr kevin gabayan the chief executive officer of plantina a startup company that provides financial services to filipinos uh before he founded and headed the um, he, before he co-founded and headed Plantina, Mr. Gabayan was previously a computer vision <coughs> researcher at NASA Ames and led data, data science uh, at BOM uh, Technologies when it was acquired by Google. After being an Android machine learning engineer, he founded a team at Google's um, area 
120 incubator to improve emerging market credit access. Kevin has been granted four patents in mobile behavioral data. And as Flintina's uh, CEO, he is responsible for product and technology development. He has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the UCLA and a Master of Science and PhD in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University. Let's listen to Plantina's comments on the study's uh, findings and um, recommendations as well as uh, its experience as a start startup uh, fintech company. Kevin, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Sheila. I'm very honored to participate today. And thank you, Dr. Kimbo and the PIDS team for this re rich uh, research report. Um, at Plantina, we've learned a lot from this report and uh, my reactions are both academic and emotional uh, as well for, for something I just care about a lot. Um, if I, uh, great, I do have share access, so I will share my presentation. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Kevin, uh, CEO and co-founder of Plantina. We're building more accessible financial services for emerging markets, starting in the Philippines. And we've recently expanded into Vietnam. We've raised a total of 5.7 million US dollars in funding to date. And I am Filipino American. My parents left the Philippines and I was born in Los Angeles. I'm a techie. I'm an ex-NASA, ex-startup, ex-Google acquisition data scientist and engineer. The further I got into my tech career, the fewer Filipinos I saw. And I've always wanted to help correct that. I've been called a sea turtle because I'm serving my heritage country. I'm here to help build a better Philippines and Filipinos should have the same kind of tech and resources that anyone in Silicon Valley has. So I've been working with Filipino youth uh, for over a decade now, um, trying to help them achieve their dreams. Um, here pictured are new graduates I've worked with from Bataan. Fresh out of college, just starting their adult lives. We took this photo seven years ago when we ran a webinar series connecting them to technology leaders in Silicon Valley. And my, my co-founder Earl Valencia and I are back uh, to serve more Filipino youths with financial services to give them more purchasing power and to keep them out of debt cycles. So, um, you know, thank you for this, this report. Uh, this, the, the paper cites national uh, fintech scores, which reflects the fintech businesses that these countries have already produced in the past. And one of these factors is ease of doing business in each country. And looking at the Philippines score amongst these Asian leaders, you might get excited and you should because Filipino FinTech is real and it's growing. And it's the ease of business part that uh, surprises me because uh, Plantina has founded corporate entities in three countries so far in the United States, in the Philippines and Vietnam. And uh, unfortunately, the Philippines was the hardest uh, for us uh, to, to set up. So just take a look at how long it took us to incorporate our business in each country. So in blue, we have the number of days it took us to get our certificate of incorporation in each country. Uh, and in red, we have the amount of time that was spent in processing. Uh, so in the United States, we could incorporate completely online. We went to clerky.com, we filled out some forms, and by the end of the week, then we received a PDF of our articles of incorporation in, in our inbox. Um, in the Philippines, it took us seven months to get our certificate of incorporation. So this isn't exactly a fair comparison. We needed to do a lot in the Philippines. We're applying from, uh, from the United States, uh, we sought a, lending, sought a lending license at the same time of our business corporate incorporation, which undergoes more, secure, more scrutiny by the SEC. Um, and there are a lot of clearances uh, for us to complete. So also we submitted our application materials at the onset of the pandemic. 
So at that time, the SEC had shut down uh, most of its uh, most of its work. Uh, its staff was working from home, and uh, at this time, it doesn't even include the time that it, that uh, we needed afterwards to acquire our local business permits to begin operations. So the next year, we started a business entity in Vietnam. And we expected that it would take just as long as the Philippines, but we received our articles of incorporation uh, within within the, you know, two to three months. And um, this isn't a fair comparison either because Vietnam has fewer classifications of financial services. But in our experience, among all the markets that we've served, entering the Philippines, our own mother country was the hardest to enter. And I draw attention to this because it's a critical factor for new startups. So imagine, being a new founder and trying to pitch a new fintech idea to an investor. Hey, I've got this great fintech idea. Oh yeah, well, how much money are you are you making? Uh, well, I'm not making money yet because I can't launch it until we get this license. And then they ask, okay, well, when are you gonna get that license? And then you say, uh, I, I don't know, we've applied for it, but you know, hopefully we'll get these clearances and licenses as, as soon as possible. And so, you know, every day that it takes a founder to establish operations is additional cost to the founder, additional risk to the founder and the investor. It, it just reduces the value of your startup when, when you're raising money. So that delayed processing also delays a startup's ability to raise capital. So um, if your operations are blocked uh, on acquiring a government license, you can't raise significant funds until you've begun those operations. And as a former data scientist, I like tracking metrics to optimize them. And some government offices post processing times of under three minutes when my actual wait processing, processing time has been three hours. And you know, some processes that we expected to take minutes uh, you know, could take months in some cases. So um, very helpful to have performance metrics that reflect our current experiences. So. No, it's not just uh, the Philippines uh, or Vietnam um, that suffers from you know this this need for this tracking. This is a dashboard of processing times for the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services Office. So um, you know this is an office you know uh, where American immigration doesn't have a great reputation for moving fast. But note that these processing times are in months. Um, but you know, this dashboard lets us know what to expect and where are the opportunities for them to improve. So I wish business operations with all the government agencies that we work with were completed, um, not just timely and consistently, but with transparent performance metrics to track improvements that were reflective of our, of our experiences. So, um, you know, every month, there's news of the SEC shutting down online lenders for abusive and predatory practices recently. And we're glad, um, you know, companies need to comply to the law uh, with operating licenses, licenses, acceptable prices and services that respect privacy and security. So um, you know, here's a slide from the SEC website. Um, you know, thanks to the SEC and the NPC, Consumers are now more aware of the risks what, that they face when they use lending services. Another 35 lenders were shut down last November with over 2,000 uh, shut down to date. And now at the same time, now a lot of people are scared of online lenders in general. So there are actually Filipino companies like Plantina who are legit. So, you know, we provide more accessible and more affordable financial services for the 98% of Filipinos that can't get a credit card. And I love that the government is protecting Filipinos from scams. I wish the SEC would also endorse online financial services that are legit, which are good for our country so that people know which ones are safe and good and which ones uh, to avoid. So, you know, Plantina is happy to work with the SEC. So uh, from the report, this plot indicates that the Philippines needs venture capital uh, more than any other sampled country in this Ernst & Young report. The same Ernst & Young report also indicates startups demanding more government funding for startups. Um, and government grants that don't add red tape to a startup's progress would be lovely, 
though I don't believe that government grants are going to be enough for a seed startup to raise a year's worth of growth runway alone. So for a significant pre-seed round demanding upwards of say 7 million pesos or more, I believe the opportunity lies in getting more Filipino startups to unlock money from more international investors. So there are many, many international VCs out there are making great progress connecting the Philippines to Western investors. And more attention is on the Philippines due to exciting fintechs like Yield Guild Games, like Paymongo and, well, Plantina. Um, but most global investors in the West aren't yet comfortable taking bets in the Philippines because they just don't know much about the Philippines. So we've met U.S. investors that are so unfamiliar with the Philippines and Southeast Asia that they've been skeptical if there was any real difference between uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, or if it was just some bothersome political correctness to mention that there's a difference. But um, when more of these top tier investors make investments in, in the Philippines, and they have recently, and when they have successful exits, then we're going to see more foreign investments at higher valuations. And to accomplish this, we'll continue connecting more Filipino founders with global startup ecosystems. I'm happy to have connected Filipino founders to my own Silicon Valley network and vice versa. So I love seeing founders in the Filipino startup community support each other. Here's another table from the PIDS paper, which broke down the post-secondary majors by discipline. So engineering and tech skills are critical for our tech startups to serve their core functions as, techno tech as technology companies and for them to succeed. And you'll see here that engineering and tech representation amongst our graduates have stayed flat over the last decade. And that's also comparable to the United States um, when it comes to the share of graduates for engineering. Um, what's most What's important here you know, for startups is how many of these tech graduates can build startups. So for that, I'd like to focus on how many computer science graduates with modern skills are being produced in the Philippines. So we're hiring software engineers at Plantina, and I recently re received a resume from a young engineer who was a recent graduate from the Philippines whose primary programming language was COBOL. So COBOL, is a programming language developed uh, that was, was developed in the 1960s back when computers used to be programmed with punch cards. Um, it's a good skill to be able to program legacy systems and it, it counts as tech and it's in engineering, but, but you know, th those skills aren't modern and won't make you globally competitive um, alone. And I can't, and, and you know, COBOL can't immediately help start, but startups build the future. Um, we've also met some of the world's greatest engineers from the Philippines. And I just love for everyone in the Philippines to have equitable access to modern skills. And that makes it critical for university faculty, regardless of their tenure, to keep up with the pace of computer science and constantly refresh their curriculum to equip our students with globally competitive skills. So um, for example, um, at, at Stanford, after the iPhone came out in 2007, Stanford came out with this very popular iPhone programming course, and uh, you know, just the next year by 2008. And that course alone had made some students rich by 2009, uh, after they launched their, their iPhone apps. I tried looking up the number of computer science graduates each year in the Philippines. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find it, but in the United States, you'll note that computer science enrolled has increased over 50% since 2009, which enables the United States to build more startups, and we need to keep up. Um, we also need to ensure Filipino faculty have modern and competitive skill sets to teach engineering students. So at one university, I studied the cost breakdowns of startup projects founded by Filipino university students, and often the largest line item was consultant fees. So when I asked the university, why was there consultant fees for the startup projects? I was told that their faculty was unable to help the students build what they wanted to build. So they hired external contractor engineers to do it for them. It's critical for faculty to be able to 
teach their students what they want to build. And, and fortunately, there's a ton of free computer science education available online. And whether it's consumed by faculty, by students, or anyone with an internet connection, with the burning desire to learn, um, it, it's available. And I'd love for us to, to leverage uh, more of that, that content. So technology education doesn't only come from universities and books. At every Filipino startup, then Filipino engineers are learning how to build startups and they're getting better at it. When our startups succeed, their staff will graduate and they'll create more startups and more will succeed. And we already have that momentum. So um, I wholeheartedly agree with the PIDS paper. This is a huge opportunity to support more technology startups uh, with ease of doing business, supportive government, leverage of global funds, and technology education. For Plantina to support financial services growth in the Philippines, we want to help address these key issues in the Philippines, so please consider this conversation just to start to an ongoing relationship exploring how Plantina can serve the Philippines fintech ecosystem and the Philippines business infrastructure in data science, in machine learning, business development, digital marketing, and industry regulation to do what's right and fair for the Filipino community. I'm terribly proud of the global attention that the Philippines has gained. In recent years, um, the Philippines can do it. We are doing it. And with hard work, we're succeeding and we will succeed. So thanks for the opportunity and uh, salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kevin uh, Gabayan, for your um, uh, thought provoking um, comments. Okay. So uh, let's continue the conversation. And this time we will hear from um, when our next discussion. So let's listen to the voice of the industry association, uh, which represents the interests of the fintech community in the Philippines. With us in this seminar is none other than uh, the executive uh, director of Fintech Philippines Association, Ms. Amor Maklang. Ms. Maklang is also um, a co-founder of uh, Geyser Maklang Marketing Communications, a board member of the French uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry in the Philippines, chair for innovations of, uh, the U of the European Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines and founding director of the Philippine Energy Independence Council. She is an award-winning brand architect, risk issues uh, and crisis strategies, strategist and marketing and communications innovator. Uh, Ms. Um, Ms. McClung is also the convener of the World FinTech Festival and Digital Filipinas, a whole of nation and whole of society movement to create a globally competitive technology and innovation ecosystem for the Philippines. She is uh, one of the country's leading communications, marketing and public relations practitioner in the sphere of digital transformation, blockchain, cryptocurrency, and nascent technologies. Friends, I now give you Ms. Amor Maklang. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon. Um, mayong uh, hapon and assalamu alaikum. I'm assuming that we are heard uh, across the country. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sheila Siar, uh, and of course, uh, our president, uh, Mr. Aniceto Orbeta, and um, kudos to uh, uh, Dr. Kimba, uh, our PIDS senior researchers, and of course, um, Ms. Jove Howe, uh, one of the uh, quiet rock stars in the fintech world, and very pleased to actually meet um, Kevin of Plentina um, for the first time. Now, it's this industry is so dynamic and there's never really been a better time to be a Filipino and in FinTech than now. And just to kind of give you context, um, we are actually right now running a nascent technology summit specifically on Web 3.0 which is what powers uh, our fintech ecosystem right now with the DOSD. But I told Dr. Sheila that there's absolutely no way 
that I would miss this opportunity to speak in behalf of an industry that has changed our lives so much and um, has the potential to actually put the Philippines not just in the regional but in a global map. Did you know, for starters, that um, uh, we actually are in the history annals when it comes to fintech? What would smart money possibly being the first ever e-money in the country, and it was intended specifically for um, remittance. Now, the people behind smart money are also active players in the fintech industry, namely, for example, um, the current president of GoTime, Mr. Jojo Malolos. So my talk and my reaction uh, to the presentation this afternoon uh, before I get started, it's really coming from um, applications that and programs that we have had to undertake given the realizations coming from the findings. Our programs do, might not have the benefit of having seen this research beforehand, but I'm happy to see that we're actually in the right direction. And I've actually taken a few steps in order to accelerate the threats that were identified here. Now, uh, if you'd allow me, I have a few slides to talk about how um, we have decided to take on the challenges, not just for FinTech, but primarily for um, digitalizing and digitizing our country overall. So next slide, please. In Digital Filipinas and in FinTech Philippines Association, we have a rather different perspective on FinTech, which is how do we use FinTech as the fuel to digitalize and tech up various legacy verticals? So in reference to what uh, Dr. Kimba said earlier, where we perhaps saw the robust movement of money, uh, that industry thrived. And it wasn't fintech per se that instigated the digitalization, it was the movement of money. And so how we look at fintech is not so much as a, uh, it's not so much as a vertical, but rather as a horizontal. By the way, Chino, after this, I'm going. I, I'm. I'm going to run the video on um, DP, especially at, as it pertains to fintech. So kindly cue it, please. No? As part of the reaction, have you ever noticed that it's somehow easier to, you know, imagine the future when it's actually far away than when it's nearly upon you? I guess you know, in some ways, that's because the near future holds the onus of decision making. So. Right now, everyone's saying that the problems of the future are for the future generation to solve. But maybe that's not how we look at it from a fintech filter. So when you see the Philippines five years from now, what do you see? And not only do I believe in the greatness of the Philippines, I'm also a big believer in the greatness of the Philippines as it pertains to nascent technologies, especially tech. Um, and I believe that many of you here today, especially our panelists, believe in that as well. And that's why together we have built Digital Filipinas, which is now the largest private sector-led advocacy in terms of creating a killer ecosystem for technology and innovation in the country. And I've got a not-so-big secret for you. What powers Digital Filipinas is fintech. Because we have come to this collective realization that you can't solve age-old problems, keeping us from the brighter future when we use the same old mindsets that created those problems in the first place. So when retail is infused with fintech, it becomes e-commerce. When insurance is infused with fintech, it becomes insurtech. 
when banking and payments is infused with fintech, it becomes fintech overall or open finance. And what I'm trying to say here is I'm trying to I'm trying to demonstrate the fact that fintech is what fuels a lot of the digitalization that has happened. We need to think about each other. Technology is what fundamentally links us, and all of us need to participate and work together. At this point in our development, if we prioritize competition over co-opetition, and this is a, a very fundamental tenet that I'd like for you guys to be able to take away in the fintech industry. There is no such thing as competition. It's very important that we continue to work together. The more you break down the walled gardens, then the more your industry or your company will thrive. Those who came from the old school of building their own ecosystem from the ground up, I'll do my own cybersecurity, I'll do my own payment, um, um, uh, payment gateway, as opposed to working and collaborating, you'll see that it's those businesses that will be under existential threat very soon. So while we are fighting over scraps, what we really should be doing is growing the market, making it bigger, and eating a much bigger steak together. The Digital Pilipinas movement is in its third journey, third year of its journey. When leader, where leaders committed to transformation can find ideas, resources, and allies that they need. Earlier in the uh, uh, report of the PIDS, I think what was uh, unspoken there was the importance of building an ecosystem, an enabling ecosystem. Because for many, being a catalyst for change here in the Philippines has been sad and alienating. As if we're not just in a ge geographic ar archipelago, but an innovation archipelago also. But in Digital Filipinas, we believe in the power of technology to cut across industries, borders, cultures that bring us together. Now, I wanted to talk to you guys about four interventions that directly address the findings of the research that were shared that, that were shared with us today. The first is we are launching in Digital Filipinas the Digital Filipinas Academy for um, leaders in innovation and technology. So last quarter of 2021, we launched together with the MAS, that's the Monetary Authority of Singapore, a mic here in the Philippines, a micro-certification course on Web 3.0. It's accessible, it's snackable, and your credentials are kept with you on the blockchain. So imagine this webinar that you, this amazing webinar that's been put together by the PIDS. How do you prove that you actually attended this webinar? How do you test that you've learned something from this webinar if we do not attach micro-learning and micro-certification to it? The purpose of the Academy is to create a rapid, affordable, accessible, and a credible training internship and fellowship program capable of preparing the Filipino workforce at all levels. Technology for all its promise is useless if no one can use it and adapt it properly. So if you are asking, what is an advocate like myself? not a coder and not a banker doing in fintech it's because what we need at the end of the day is to create an ecosystem that is connected and for more advocates to come out within their specific industries to actually take on fintech i have this running joke that when i grow up one day what i want to be is a human api and later, I'll share with you the importance of an API in creating a truly digital economy. Now, going back to education. For those of you who need to upskill or reskill your workforce, and I've seen this as a great demand amongst the co-conveners of Digital Filipinas. 
we need to be able to immediately deliver a works workforce, not just from the STEAM side, meaning the engineering and, 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 and coding side, but also in terms of middle management all the way to the board. Who will be conserve, conversant with, say, for example, the fundamentals of cloud, on-site, cybersecurity, interoperability, APIs? This mindset, we're in, no, that's not intended for me because I'm not in technology. We cannot have that kind of mindset anymore. In the same manner that all of us are expected to read and write, every one of us should be in the future expected to understand those fundamentals in Web 3.0. So I would also like to commend at this point um, our partner in Digital Pilipinas. So aside from our work with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Department of Finance, the Department of Trade and Industry, the DICT and the NPC, we're actually, we just today, we announced our partnership with the Department of Science and Technology to champion university-based innovation hubs with a very, very palpable orientation towards Web 3.0. So today we launched that partnership that would help guide and inform the close to 300 researchers of DOST PSERG to come up with recommendations related to Web 3.0. Innovation needs to be local. Innovation cannot be planned from Great Manila. The needs in Samar, for example, will be very different from the needs in Pangasinan. You can't expect what works in Manila to work everywhere else, so the innovation response must be made regional. STEM can work side by side with pragmatic learning for the average Filipino to understand and use these emerging technologies. I like what um, our friend from Plantina said, how can we have teachers that don't understand what's actually happening in the workforce? And so part of our academy is an internship and a fellowship program that would allow for a one-year rotation amongst various fintechs, technology companies, and traditional uh, financial institutions at three months each, either for undergraduates and also at the same time for those who are career shifting. Aside from our work in terms of innovating at the regional level, we will be finding opportunities to tech up LGUs. And this on March 10, together with the Department of Trade and Industry, we will be launching our Digital Pilipinas Innovation Cities, Innovative Cities Program, forgive me. And the intent is, how do we ensure that we're able to tech up LGUs, institute certain levels of payments and security, and at the same time, make LGUs and cities more startup and fintech friendly? Now, many of you have heard or are involved with Web 3.0, or I call third wave internet technology. How does it differ? from Web 1.0 or Web, web 2.0. So Web 1.0 is all about the internet, internet of informational exchange, photos, videos. Many of us in um, occasionally with, with kid, it's the internet of porn. Web 2.0, on the other hand, is the internet of social media. And Web 3.0 is the internet of money and trust. This is the collection of technologies that are currently rewriting the global economy and have the potential to bring a lot of opportunities into Filipino hands if we don't lag behind or take a passive stance in how this will be implemented here. Playing a big part in this third wave are APIs. In my many talks overseas, I like to think of them as the language of love that connects businesses, lets their systems communicate with each other and creates new opportunities. In some ways, I like to liken myself as a human API because a big part of what we do in Digital Filipinas and Fintech Philippines Association is precisely to connect.
But anyway, what we really do in the Philippine API marketplace, where many businesses from many fields can find and link their APIs easily, payments, transactions, and the like, because bilateral connecting is arduous. I heard that earlier. That's not the intent. The intent is to be able to give everyone an irrevocable right to do business with anyone at any time, whenever they, they want to, without having to say, no, that can't be done, NPC won't allow it, blah, 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 blah. Fortunately, we have forged a partnership with Apex, the company building the platform for the Monetary Authority of Singapore, and we will be rolling out a Digital Pilipinas API platform very soon. So, I can entertain more questions on that later. But needless to say, a digital economy and a fintech-led economy is an API-led economy. Last two points. E-commerce has come into its own in the Philippines. We cannot talk about fintech and not talk about the growth of e-commerce. But beyond joining the mega platforms, a network of support is now being given to support Filipino SMEs via education and also resources to aid in their successful transition to online businesses. Digital Pilipinas is the local partner of Proxterra. And together, last quarter of 2021, together with the Department of Trade and Industry, we launched together the Business Without Borders platform for any Filipino MSME that would like to explore selling their products and services to other countries. Of course, we will continue to advocate championing several verticals. Like I said earlier, FinTech is the fuel that powers these verticals. And FinTech has mushroomed in the Philippines to EduTech, Open Finance, InsureTech, HealthTech, Gaming, Cybersecurity, Play to Earn, RegTech, and of course, e-commerce. In order to continue to spur innovation, not just within the Philippines, we are also launching at least three hackathons that will take on these age-old problems. And we call it the Philippines versus the world. Philippines versus food insecurity, Philippines versus underinsurance, and so on and so forth. The ideas generated will be plowed back into the API marketplace and into the ecosystem for investments and then subsequently elevated to a sandbox for a test and learn proof of concept. The Banco Central ng Pilipinas is one of the most outstanding regulators, not in the Philippines, but in the world. And Ms. Jovius actually heard me say this. Most of the time, I drop the word regulator and call them an enabler. They have really enabled the growth of this industry while at the same time making sure that we always do the right thing. So truly, I never get tired of talking about the work of the BSP whenever I speak overseas. Last but not the least is the importance of legislative, continued legislative, judicial, and executive advocacy. We are a whole of nation and a whole of society approach to digitalization. We need better laws governing technology and fostering a new way of doing business. We see it. We see it. Albeit a bit more unobtrusively, say, with the Banco Central, but for other countries like, say, Taiwan or Singapore, the role of teching up government has really fallen on the hands, a big part of it has fallen on the hands of those who are championing fintech. Because at the end of the day, as Jerry, as, the, as they said in the movie Jerry Maguire, it's all about show me the money. I am heartened to let you know that between the Banco Central, the DOF, DTI, DOST, we are actually 
leading a group of innovative USEX, ASEX, and secretaries and directors who are really changing the landscape. The Philippines, in closing, can truly be a hub for investments. And it was described in the paper earlier how we may be lagging behind in terms of investments in the space um, after Indonesia and Singapore. Any talk on fintech will not be complete without the cross-border cooperation that is currently happening right now amongst ASEAN. ASEAN, after all, is the largest fintech in the world. So, recently, um, which is uh, maybe a few months back, a former Philippine colonizer and a superpower, a Western superpower, and I got on a call because they said, Amor, how can we help you in Digital Filipinas? And what I said quite nicely and politely was, Sir, you have 10 banki digital banking licenses. Europe has 15. Asia has 40. The Philippines has six. So, sir, with all due respect, how can we help you? How can we help you? Full stop. And at that point, it really felt good to be both a Filipino and a little brown Asian. Um, now, in closing, I know I said this already, but I cannot not talk about 2022 and the elections. I'm less concerned about the fortunes of individual candidates, but I am more concerned about them or any candidate for that matter, pushing an innovation and a digital agenda for the country. I am not concerned about platitudes and lovely jingles, but rather I encourage everyone to vote based on a palpable technology, innovation, and even a fintech agenda. This is an arena where the Philippines is at the forefront. We cannot absolutely lose that distinct advantage. So on that note, I would like to thank uh, the PIDS, and I reiterate my call to collaborate with the PIDS in, be, in behalf of Digital Filipinas, in behalf of Fintech Philippines Association, in behalf of all our partners and co-conveners who are the leading movers and shakers in the fintech industry. We look forward to continue teching up the country one industry at a time, one student at a time, one city at a time, and all powered by fintech. Maraming maraming salamat po at mabuhay po ang digital Pilipinas. And thank you very much, uh, Executive Director Amor Maklang of Fintech Philippines uh, Association for sharing your insights. And uh, thank you also for sharing with us uh, the um, initiatives um, and of uh, digital Pilipinas. We will hear more from um, uh, Edie Maklang during the open forum. Okay, so friends, our discussion won't be complete without uh, the country's central bank, which has been uh, vigorously pushing for the growth of our fintech indus industry through effective oversight of fintech and other innovative alternatives. I think uh, Edie Maklang has given us a, a very good introduction to our uh, next um, uh, discussion. So we are honored to. Uh, to have with us today Ms. Uh, Juvelin Howe, who currently heads the FinTech Innovation and Policy Research Group under the Technology Risk and Innovation Supervision Department of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. The group uh, that she leads serves as the primary contact for FinTech players in the Philippines, particularly those with underlying DSP regulated activities. And prior to her current role, she was also part of the Cybersecurity Supervision and Oversight Group of BSP. Ms. Howe is also heavily involved in various ongoing policy initiatives of the BSP, such as the Open Finance Framework, amendments to the regulations on cloud outsourcing, and regulatory sandbox 
framework. Ms. Hao, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, um, Sheila. Um, and uh, before I, hello, before I start my presentation, I'd like to thank, of course, PIDS and um, a good afternoon to my co-discussants, um, Kevin and, of course, Misa Moore. Uh, I hope I share half of their passion when it comes to, to fintech. So let me share my screen. Um, are you now seeing my screen? Yes, Shobi, we can see your screen. Okay, so good afternoon again, everyone. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Um, to everyone joining us here via WebEx and um, sa mga um, nagjo-join po sa atin sa Facebook. Uh, good afternoon to all. So let me begin by saying um, that by now, I think it's quite obvious, no, uh, that um, and I'm, I'm sure most of us would agree that digital adoption has played a key role in keeping things going amid the paralyzing effects of the pandemic, uh, which began um, in for the Philippines in March of 2020. Uh, so through the use of fintech, um, transformational digital financial products and services are available to reach even the unbanked and the underserved population. So actually in the BSP would like we would like to think that, um, in a way, the NRPS uh, framework through InstaPay and PesoNet um, was able to greatly contribute to this, um, uh, keeping things going amid the pandemic. So um, FinTech actually serves as an innovative gateway um, for, for the underserved and the unbanked population to gainfully participate in the economy. Um, so we would want them to actually um, um, have their lives uh, enhanced uh, in terms of uh, the quality of their life uh, to, of course, contribute to the progress of, of the country, of the Philippines. And uh, as we're seeing the pandemic, and of course, um, considering that uh, the developments in the digital financial landscape is really fast-paced and um, it's quite high-evolving, um, this has actually brought forward the need to recalibrate the financial inclusion strategy. So back in 2015, um, a financial inclusion strategy was launched by the F FISC or the Financial Inclusion Steering Committee. So this is actually being chaired by the BSP and um, a number of government agencies are members of this um, committee. So um, just recently, um, in, in um, Q3, I think, of last year, um, the FISC uh, decided to recalibrate this financial inclusion strategy. So now we just recently launched the six-year strategy, um, or what we call the National Strategy for Financial in 2022 to 2028. So this um, new six-year strategy aims to facilitate a coherent, well-coordinated, and whole-of-nation undertaking towards the achievement of the vision of inclusive growth and financial resilience for every Filipino. So building on the principles-based approach of the original strategy, the desired outcomes of the NSFI 2022 to 2028 um, include First is reduce disparities in financial inclusion. Second would be to improve the financial health and resilience. And uh, third would be to have more financially capable and empowered consumers. And lastly, increased access to finance for MSMEs, including the startup companies and the agriculture sector. So what, what, uh, what do we do in order to um, achieve these uh, desired outcomes. So included in the NSFI um, uh, are the um, strategic objectives, uh, which will be pursued hand in hand, not just uh, not only by the BSP, but um, also in partnership with the 21 other government agencies and, of course, private partners um, um, in, in achieving the strategic objectives of the NSFI. So the four strategic objectives um, 
include first is uh, the promotion of inclusive digital finance. So here, um, this will really be um, um, evolving around the use of fintech in terms of um, uh, empowering or or transforming the the financial sector into into a digital finance um, market. So the second would be strengthening financial education and consumer protection. So this was actually discussed uh, by uh, and included in the paper uh, by the PIDS. So as mentioned there, um, there's really this knowledge gap uh, when it comes to fin fintech um, knowledge base in the country. So um, that's also part of the, the NSFI strategy. Um, and then third would be to enhance access to risk protection and social safety nets. And last would be to enhance the agriculture and MSM financing ecosystem. So um, recognizing the, the one of the challenges mentioned in the paper um, when it comes to the regulatory framework or the regulatory approach of financial regulators and other government agencies. So um, now I'd like to share the BSP's approach. Um, this actually, this has always been our approach um, way back before uh, even pre-pandemic days. And um, I think uh, this was also mentioned by Ms. Amor um, during the time when um, there's really no regulations on e-money. Um, we've engaged with the our private sector partners in, you know, um, studying this new technology, this emerging technology at that time, and uh, not allowing the lack of regulations to hinder the progress of those innovative technologies. So uh, to share with you for the BSP, our regulatory approach has always been shaped by uh, the three principles that you can see on your screen. So first, um, we ensure that regulation is risk-based, um, that it is proportionate and fair. So the second one would be we, we always maintain active multi-stakeholder collaboration. We don't limit it to just um, other government agencies or financial regulators. Um, we also actively engage with private partners, private institutions, um, as well as regulators and other um, um, legal authorities from outside of the Philippines because we would also want to, to baseline and look at what they're doing in terms of um, their regulatory framework and the landscape in, in their specific jurisdictions and take out or, or uh, take note of uh, some of the things that are working for them that we think may also work um, for us here in the Philippines. And lastly, we ensure that innovations must work for the benefit of consumers, especially the most vulnerable ones and those availing of financial services for the first time. So in this slide, um, you can see that um, for the BSP, we really believe that uh, digital transformation actually reinforces financial inclusion and, technolo and technological advancement program. So these are um, mutually reinfor reinforcing goals of the BSP, the digitalization and financial inclusion. So in, in, in um, promoting the growth of digital financial ecosystem, um, one, on the one hand, uh, we have digitalization, which will allow financial institutions to, of course, broaden their client base and, um, you know, be able to tap uh, other revenue sources. And, and, and um, lastly, I think this is also very important for, for the businesses, for them to improve on uh, operational efficiency, right? And then uh, on the other hand, we're also looking at financial consumers and how will they benefit from from this uh, financial technology from fintech. So um, the possibilities in, uh, actually the there are use cases on this already, um, is on benefiting um, when it comes to um, having the convenience of completing transactions uh, at a much, um, at a much uh, faster pace, um, enjoying also lower costs of um, 
financial transactions. And um, I think the very basic but very important access to these financial products and services. So for the BSP, um, we, we uh, have several drivers actually for this uh, digital transformation. So first is on the, uh, the digital payments transformation roadmap. Uh, which actually has two uh, objectives. Uh, the twin objectives include, um, first is on increasing the, num the percentage of total retail transactions um, to at least 50% digital payments. And then the second goal is to um, increase and expand financial inclusion um, with the target of having at least 70% of adult Filipinos to be onboarded to the formal financial system. And then um, another thing is, um, this is also mentioned earlier, on um, having a digital banking framework. So now we already have um, six licensed uh, digital banks, and the BSP looks at these um, digital banks to be um, you know, to be our partners, of course, and additional channels um, in providing uh, the Filipino people um, access to digital financial products and services. So, um, mostly what, um, what these digital banks are, are able to offer is really an end-to-end -end, um, banking experience. Uh, so, so, people don't need to leave the comforts of their home um, from account opening to, to um, doing their financial transactions with a bank, they can do that with, uh, with a digital bank. And then next is on actually the issuance of the open finance framework. Um, we, we actually just recently issued this, um, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, July of last year. And what, what we want here um, um, in terms of this open finance framework is really for this to promote industry competition by empowering, giving the power back to consumers in terms of um, um, having uh, full control of their financial information. So they are the ones who have, who has the power to, to uh, dictate uh, where their financial information goes uh, who um, gets to have access to their personal financial information. So we're, we're currently working with the industry in terms of defining the governance standards and other um, um, policies and guidelines that uh, need to be established. And then another thing that we're, we're working on right now is on market-based banking model. We've actually just recently... Um, um, actually, the deadline was just, uh, I think, a few weeks back um, because we, we recently issued the, the draft circular, for, um, which is open for comments from, from external stakeholders um, on the digital financial marketplace uh, framework. So we're, we're um, currently uh, consolidating the comments that we have received from both internal and external stakeholders. And then lastly, um, I'd also like to, to um, touch on a bit um, when it comes to the regulatory sandbox framework. So actually, uh, we've been doing, the BSP has, has been doing the test and learn approach way back, um, I think, even before 2009, way, way back before um, those times. Because in 2009, we issued the, the e-money um, um, electronic money um, issuer guidelines. So before that, before issuing that uh, specific circular on, on electronic money, we, we used this test and learn approach and worked with private sectors. So actually the, the two major um, e-money wallet providers in the country right now, we've worked with them in terms of defining um, guidelines in, in piloting uh, this uh, technology uh, way back um, um, when, when we, we um, launched this test and learn approach with them. So um, as a result of that uh, collaborative efforts uh, with the private sector, we were able to come up with what we now what we now have as the e-money circular or the e-money guidelines. And 
um, now, uh, since we are seeing a lot more um, um, innovative technologies and emerging business models, um, the BSP has um, already decided to adopt a balanced approach to innovation. Um, and we would want to formalize the test and learn approach into a regulatory sandbox uh, framework. So the key elements of the regulatory sandbox uh, framework would include the eligibility requirements, the oversight framework, and the testing parameters. So to, um, I think to, to end uh, my um, discussion and comments uh, um, regarding the PIDS uh, paper, um, I just want to, you know, um, share this um, personal thought that uh, there's really no going back to our pre-pandemic way of life, um, at least for for the financial services industry. Um, so I think uh, for the BSP, we would really want to move forward and continue to leverage on the gains uh, brought about by by fintech innovations, which have actually um, helped us uh, weather the challenges of this pandemic. And um, I'd like to also. Um, uh, share that um, you know um, this this fintech landscape, um, these technologies. Um, it's an evolving market, and um, I mean, tomorrow uh, there there may be a new a uh, buzzword that would uh, come out, right? Uh, so for us regulators, we wouldn't want us to be the barriers for um, these technologies. To, to reach out and um, you know um, uh, be able to to do their share in advancing the lives of our countrymen um, we wouldn't want to be stuck with this um, uh, very old school uh, way of thinking or, or mindset um, so as much as we can the BSP really balances our approach uh, towards innovation um, by embracing of course this um, um, pioneering and cohesive solutions, but of course, so, of course, also balancing um, our main mandate, which is to promote um, the safety and soundness and resiliency of the financial sector. So, with that, uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'd like to turn back the virtual floor over to to Sheila. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Miss uh, Jovelina. How uh, for sharing with us the initiatives of um, of uh, uh, the Banco Central and Pilipinas, and of course for sharing it with your insights. I quite agree with you that there's no turning back. <laughs> the only way to go is to uh, look ahead, uh, move forward, and embrace um, innovation. Thank you very much, Jovi. We'll hear more from you during the open forum, friends. Uh, so we have heard the reactions and insights of our uh, discussions. So. At this point, we would like to hear from you. But before uh, we go to the open forum, let's have a poll. Okay. And in this poll, um, we would like to know the type of fintech service uh, that you frequently use. Okay. So here's our poll uh, question for today. And we're giving you six seconds to, to answer it. Okay. Here's the question. And um, this Call is also open to our uh, viewers on Facebook. Here's the question. Which of the following fintech services do you frequently use? Is it A, mobile payment and wallet, B, mobile banking, C, digital lending and credit, D, trading and cryptocurrency or E, remittance? Okay, so please key in your answer now. Of course, there are other fintech services, so I just uh, selected the more popular ones. Okay. So when is it uh, okay? Yes. The poll has ended, so we will reveal reveal to you the uh, results um, later. Of course, there is no right or or wrong answer. We just want to hear your uh, thoughts, okay? Uh, um, in terms of um, the the fintech service that you're always using or you frequently use. And as a token of our appreciation to those who participated in our poll, we will pick two names each from WebEx and Facebook, and we will give a, um, a small token of uh, a prize um, for your participation. Okay, 
So friends, let us now go to the open forum and I invite our presenter, Dr. Kim Ban, our discussants, Mr. Kevin Gabayan, um, Executive Director Amor Maklang and uh, Ms. Chovilin Pao. Okay, so let us now entertain some questions. Let me check our chat box. Okay, um, okay. Um, we have um, uh, two questions related to the data. They would like to uh, get, um, okay. This one is from Elpidio Peria. The data currently being cited seem to be from a pre-pandemic era. Perhaps the sector got jolted into prominence during the pre during the pandemic, would you have data for that? And there's also a question, uh, data related from Ramon Garcia. For demand, would the numbers change 2020 up given the rise of e-commerce during the pandemic? Well, if you have been intently listening to the presentation, in fact, Francis mentioned some 2020 data. Uh, okay, uh, so for BSP, Perhaps BSP can uh, elucidate or, or uh, share with us some more recent data based on their monitoring of Instapay and Pesonet use under the National Retail Payment System. Uh, Joveline, would you have some? Uh, yes, yeah, Sheila. Um, actually, uh, let me check from the data that I have here. So for Pesonet, uh, what I can share is the... Um, annual volume and value for the year 2020. So, um, hold on. So, for PesoNet, um, we have uh, 30, 36.8 million in terms of uh, the volume of transaction. So, that's amounting to 2.8 trillion pesos in 2020. And um, it actually represents 122% uh, growth in terms of the value as compared to uh, the previous year, 2019. And then for Instapay, um, we have um, 232.9 million in terms of the volume. So that's worth 1.2 trillion pesos. So in terms of the growth, um, based on the transaction value, um, it's a uh, 378% increase compared to the previous year. And then I can also probably share the, the virtual currency statistics. Uh, mm -hmm. So for the virtual currency um, statistics, uh, hold on, let me get to that part. Uh, so, the data that we have is as of June of last year, June 2021. So, um, it's around 19.89 uh, 19 million in terms of the total volume. And uh, it has actually exceeded already the total annual volume in 2020. So, mm -hmm. For the whole 2020, it's around 12.19 million. And the latest uh, statistics that we have, uh, it's already, as of June 2021, it's already at 19.89 million um, transaction volume. So for the equivalent uh, value, that's 105.93 billion pesos for as of June 2021. Thank you very much, Jovelyn. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, would our um, other discussants or our presenter uh, have anything to add um, in terms of uh, more yeah. recent data? Yes, uh, Francis, mm -hmm. go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, um, to supplement uh, the data from BSP, no, uh, actually in the paper, we presented the uh, 2021 figures up to October, October 2021. So we, you can really see the the change or the impact of uh, the pandemic already, um, because we the data that we obtained from BSP is a uh, monthly. So you can really you can really track to that the at certain months. Of course, at certain months there would be a decline because of you know um. Uh, uh, 
lack uh, limited uh, or of seasonality of of incomes but uh you would really see that there's a a break in the trend a really sharp increase uh that's uh brought about by by the pandemic uh, uh so i invite uh, the 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 listeners to uh, download the the discussion paper uh, because uh, the 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 data is actually there it's also from the esp so that's one and then um we tried also to include other in indicators that are um, after 2020. So uh, even indicators of talent, indicators of. So these are actually um, past uh, 20, uh, past 2020 or past 2019. So we are already well within the pandemic at, uh, at that point, uh, at this point in time. So these are indicators that uh, show. Uh, well, first is that um, the 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 trend uh, as. Uh, um, uh, Ms. Jo Villin has uh, mentioned, uh, we're not going back. Uh, it, it, it has been uh, documented by Google Temple Second Bain that um, people who have already been using e-commerce are not uh, going back from from the the practice of um, purchasing things online and paying for things online, and this is going to be sustained. So th that's one, and that's also seen in in data. And the second is that there's very little change in certain aspects. No? So even after the pandemic, talent has still been uh, has, um, not improved and uh, um, venture capital is uh, not growing as much. So so while there are the other things, no? so it's, it's, it's the, the analysis that we're providing is the ecosystem. So the, there's on the one side, there's a really uh, rapid growth. Um, and then on the other end, uh, there, and there's the potential. And then on the other end, there are some things that we really need to improve on. And uh, I, I echo the, the the call for improving our uh, our doing business uh, uh, statistics. No, so yeah, uh, seven months is <laughs> is not. I understand, no, it's really not comparable, and we we, we really want to to reduce it. But if you compare it from the best practice of three days, it, I mean that. I mean, there's a, and the, the the opportunity cost per day is actually very high, and that's something that we really need to highlight. It's not just that well, you're not doing anything, so you're not uh, incurring any costs, but the opportunity cost is is actually much higher. Yeah. Okay. yeah thank thank you. you very much, uh, um, Francis. Um, Francis, now, okay, can can I, can I have a question regarding um uh your your slide six? In, in that slide, you show the number of uh, 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 fintech companies, no? And there has been a rise from 2013 to 2014, but this gradually decreased in the succeeding years. In, investments, however, have steadily increased. So, I mean, uh, where are the investments uh, going? And uh, what are the reasons for the decreasing number of new fintech companies created in in the Philippines? You've already mentioned, and Kevin has attested to this, no? You experienced nila. It's a glaring fact, which are you, the ease of doing business in the Philippines, the processing time is way longer than in other countries. No, so what could be um what could be the the other uh, reasons? And uh, I can also throw this question to the other uh, uh, to our other discussants. No, so can we also attribute this to the foreign in, uh, ownership limit? So Kevin mentioned about the need to unlock. Uh, capital from uh, uh, foreign investors, but right now we are still saddled by that 60-40 uh, foreign ownership limit. So yeah, um, perhaps we can um, talk uh, about this uh, a bit more, uh, Francis. Then I can ask. Uh, I, I can go to Kevin and then Miss Maklang. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Sheila. You. You. I think you've um, you've observed it correctly. No. So there the new. The new fintechs, the new startups, are uh, have um, have uh, declined. No? So it 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 reached a peak and then uh, started to decline. To decline, but the the investments are actually pouring in. No? So uh, that that well to me that signals one um, first is uh, some confidence in the ones that are already existing, um, because it's um, or to the new ones because it's it's something that's uh, uh, attracting the the ha larger amount of investments. And uh, so, um, it's it's sort of a sort of a reward to to those who are uh, persevering and to those who wouldn't give up, uh, given the, the the challenges of uh, uh, a very long wait for for the 
or the incorporation papers and others. So, so yeah, but uh, I think the other issue here is, yeah, we we are not uh, existing in a vacuum. So I think in one of the 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 men, uh, uh, threats that I have mentioned is that there's the potential that's coming from other um, economies in in ASEAN. So Singapore is already established. There's Vietnam. There's uh, Indonesia, who is which are already also growing their uh, startups and their fintechs. And we are also there in 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 the competition. I I I I am a little bit anxious of using the word competition because we want to say cooperation. So we we also want to compete and cooperate with uh, our fellow um, members of ASEAN. But uh, there's it's yeah. So there's there's this. We have to send the right signals to the investors. No? So we need to send the, the first, we need to tell them that uh, ease of doing business in the field, we're open to doing business. We, uh, we have the right uh, environment and uh, regulatory environment is actually very good here. And we've actually shown that uh, because of our uh, forward looking regulators. But then there's the, also the other challenges and another, and there's also the potential. It's a very big market. It's a very big, uh, um, untapped uh, market of, of consumers and uh, which are very techy but then and yeah there's the, the other, other things no so I think that's the so we need to uh, as um, uh, sir Kevin has mentioned earlier we people don't know the Philippines you no know? so I think the two things there is we need to send the right signal and we have to be able to market the Philippines also because there's also the competition from other countries they're actually attracting possibly attracting or, or diverting some of the investment away from us. And of course, reg our domestic policies has also have to improve. You know, yeah, yeah, and that the ease of doing business really also has, has to improve. And uh, perhaps the, the others can also um, chime in. Thank you. Thank you very much, so, uh, Francis. Kevin, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks for um you know for, for the support on these uh, on these critical issues for, for startups. I can only imagine that as a founder from the Philippines, um, incorporating domestically um, can also, um, you know, the, solving these problems of time to incorporation can also reduce the cost for them to, to operate. And um, so the time that it, like each day that you're waiting for that, that licensure, um, yeah, maybe you're not spending more money on the operations of a business that has more more staff, and maybe you're burning less. But um, this is a personal investment that you know each one of these founders are taking, and so that chips away at, at your runway, um, you, know, you know, day by day. So, uh, you know, very very important. Um, you know, just enabling more Filipino founders to take more shots when it comes to uh, lowering the cost of, of starting up will enable more of our Filipino founders to, uh, you know, apply for these international sources of funds, be it applying to Y Combinator, Techstars, or uh, talking to investors that may exist anywhere in the world, be it, um, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, in, in South Asia, in United States, Europe, um, you know, South America, wherever they are, the internet is this magical tool where, you know, we all have, you know, if we have access to a computer, then we can send cold emails uh, to anyone in the world. And um, even though it's a low probability, it's so much of a numbers game where, you know, if we can take more shots, if we can lower the cost of taking more shots, we're going to take more shots as a, as a country, and we're going to end up with, uh, with more startups and, you know, more of them are going to be successful. So, um, yeah, you know, looking forward to uh, us finding out how it can reduce the uh, the incorporation time. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kevin, um, your your company has been in existence for how many years? Yes, we uh, founded our United States entity in 2019, mm -hmm. um, and the Philippine entity in 2020, 2020, and uh, the Vietnamese entity in 2021. What has been the um? What has been the outcome so far in terms of uh, the receptivity of the Filipino uh, 
here in the Philippines to your services. And can you share with us the profile of your clients? Are you reaching, let's say, uh, the underserved market? Do you think you are, you know? Uh, yes. Yes, please. Yes. So, uh, so um, you know, for, for those of you less familiar with Pontina, then um, we are uh, today a buy now, pay later service uh, serving emerging markets starting in the Philippines. We just launched in Vietnam last year. Um, our app has been downloaded on the Google Play Store um, over 300,000 times now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we are serving um, mostly millennial and Gen Z customers are, are the bulk of our, of our customers um, so that merchants can sell on credit to the over 98% uh, of Filipinos that don't have access to a credit card. So, um, so this offers more flexibility and purchasing power to our customers uh, so that they can pay later uh, for their for their purchases. Um, you know, buy now, pay later is uh, you know a credit tool that um, in the West has been used by most Americans today. Uh, Fifty six percent of Americans have used buy now, pay later uh, uh, to date, and um, it's more being viewed as a replacement uh, for a credit card. So mm -hmm. for a country that, for emerging markets that um, you know, have not had uh, widespread access to credit cards and accessible and convenient credit, um, then this can be um, a more accessible credit tool. So uh, we're excited about serving um, a, a population that mostly um, does not have access to uh, a bank account and also does not have access to, to accessible credit. Thank you very much, Kevin. Let me read a, um, a comment which is actually addressed to you. This is from Jennifer. I'm not, I don't know if you have uh, read this in the chat box, but this is actually addressed to you from Jennifer Villoria. Thank you, Kevin, for your mission to help our country I echo your views on the challenges of presenting the Philippines as an investment destination to global uh, venture capitalists. Uh, and funders, um, the platitudes you mentioned, particularly the long process in setting up companies to absorb capital is a very big factor. Okay, so that was from um, uh, Jennifer Deloria. Okay, so let's move Much on agreed. to other. <laughs> and, and cheers to you, Jennifer, for, uh, for activating more, more capital flow to the Philippines. Okay. Thank I'm you. sure. I'm sure she's faced, um, you know, those challenges of even placing the Philippines on the map for for some of those investors, right? Kind of have to square away the very basics to them. That like, oh, like their their first reaction might be, isn't Philippines a, a small country? Like they look at the world map and they're like, oh, it's that it's that it's that archipelago there. And then you have to remind them that like, I love saying, um, you know, among there there are 200 countries in the world what population rank do you think the Philippines is? And then they'll be like, oh, I don't know, what, 150, 160? And then they're surprised to hear that it's 13. So, um, you know, they're, they'd, they'd otherwise be missing out on a major market. So we're pr proud to serve that. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to another, uh, to other questions. And, uh, okay. This one is, um, these questions are from uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Dan Agustin, and it's specifically addressed to um, uh, Executive Director Amor uh, McClung. Ma'am, uh, okay. First question, how do we prevent this functional fintechs um, to go into like uh, crypto, he said, uh, he termed them as crypto scandals, like what happened in um, uh, like Union Bank and, and BDO recently. And secondly, uh, does your academy teach how to develop fintech technology so we want, we don't need to buy tech license from abroad? Okay, so, um... Thank you so much, Dr. Sheila. Allow me to unpack, because uh, there are several issues that those questions um, kind of lump together, mm -hmm. uh, but I think we need to, to kind of unpack it. First and foremost, uh, the issue on bad actors and good actors. Um, one of the reasons why uh, I haven't been in this industry very long, I've only been here since 2017, 
which was the uh, advent of the uh, blockchain crypto spring here in the Philippines, a lot of ICOs. And um, I was involved in two of the most successful races at that time. Um, unfortunately, the definition of governance at that time was just to make sure that you don't end up in jail, which for me was an unacceptable proposition because for a tool as powerful as, as, as fintech, right, um, we needed to make sure that it was properly intended to serve good. Now, some of those who've done ICOs uh, in 2017, 2018, most of them are probably no longer around. But to those who have really subsisted, so for example, in another panel right now, I just welcome Ron Hose. Um, for a, a founder of coins.ph. And to this day, they're still um, one of the strongest uh, uh, fintechs across uh, ASEAN. And I'm sure the BSP would attest to the fact that you need to make sure that who you deal with are those that are working closely with the Banco Central, those that are properly regulated. I think that's the most important thing. No? Um, we recently had a, a, a learning series on consumer financing. So this time around, it's under the purview of the NPC and the SEC. And that's the first thing that we ask. You need the consumers. You need to make sure that who you decide to part your money with are those that are working closely with the regulators. That's the most important thing. Don't necessarily believe what you read in the papers. You have to do your own do due diligence by also engaging the regulators. So that's the first, no? Now, the issue that happened with those two systemically important domestic financial institutions. This much I will say, I will not, although there are a lot of theories regarding what happened last November, we were all holding our breath as an industry. Um, I'm not going to go into the merits of the case. I think um, Ma'am Jovi might be in a better position to address that. However, the one thing I need you to understand is that the era of open finance is upon us. No? And uh, sila Ma'am Jovi, Ma'am, I owe you a, a, a campaign still to bring on board non-FIs no? as promised. But the point is, the bigger conversation that will subsume fintech eventually is open finance. And as you can see, the BSP is once again at the forefront. Now, why did I say this? Um, when you are in, in an open finance ecosystem, the way you look at security breaches is very different from how it was five, 10 years ago. There has to be sharing of data. You cannot be setting up walled gardens and saying, no, this is my problem, I'll keep it quiet, etc. Breaches are inevitable. It's not a function of if, it's a function of when. But you have to look at how your financial institutions are dealing with breaches. You can't just cut off payments and connectivity and, and transfers to another bank. I'm sorry, hashtag who got, no, ma'am, Joe. But we need to collaboratively work together to find solutions to problems because the real enemy is out there, meaning there are certain countries who have weaponized um, cyber threats, right? It, most of it is coming overseas. And domestically, the first... Uh, I was interviewed on TV on the day that the hack happened. And the first thing that we in Digital Filipina said was, we need to support domestic FIs. In other words, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to withdraw my money, blah, 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 etc. No. But at the same time, you need to be mindful how they approach the breach. It's not a function of just phishing. Huh? The onus of security is on the financial institution. You can't just shift it out to the consumer and say, you know what? I enough phishing. The unspoken about phishing is, sorry, you are dumb enough to give out your information. But that's not necessarily the case. So 
the the onus is shared by both mm-hmm. consumers and also institutions so yeah it's 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 really a gray area and the last thing about the academy in terms of learning what we are trying to do is to make the courses snackable number one in other words it's in increments of 30 minutes to one hour that can ladder up we're partnered out of Singapore, thank you to the MAS with the National University of Singapore. And here in the Philippines, we're partnered with the Mapua um, educational system of the Yuchenko and the Ayala group. No, So that's the iPeople Consortium. So we are in Digital Filipinas and Fintech Philippines, their academic partner for Fintech. So there's the certification, there's the snackable uh, component to it, and there is also the um, wallet. So last year, we rolled out a wallet to hold those credentials on the blockchain so that whatever you learn can be tested and stays with you. Um, but more importantly, like I said, beyond just the learnings, we're going to be rolling out this Q1, Q2 via a partnership with the UP College of Business Administration, admittedly one of the leading um, business schools in the country an internship and a fellowship program because learning is not enough. And what's important is that they get real life, real life experiences. Um, Teachers, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, Kevin said how many of the professors are not practitioners. So part and parcel of the internship and fellowship program that we'll do is to get the teachers to work inside the fintech ecosystem because this time around if it's in tech and fintech the only time you can teach is if you can do you know how they had pejoratively said before the only time you the only time that people teach is when they can't do well in technology it's the other way around i feel like the only time you can teach is if you do thank you Thank you very much, Ms. Moore. I saw uh, Jovi nodding his uh, nodding her head. Uh, Jovi, would you like to um, add your uh, a response to this uh, question? Uh, what in terms of keeping the um, the financial the digital ecosystem secure? Uh, would you like to share um, uh, the efforts of the BSP? Of course, we know that this is a whole of. This requires a whole of government approach, but uh, yes, we'd like to uh, right. hear the uh, the, um, <clears throat> the efforts of the BSP. Go ahead, Jovi. Yeah, actually, um, hearing from my co-discussants and uh, of course from the questions from the audience, um, I'm actually um, going to bring it back to our licensing process. Uh, not, uh, I mean, the same as uh, the the problem that uh, Kevin here encountered in terms of the incorporation um, uh, these, uh, delays in, in their incorporation processing. Of, uh, since the BSP doesn't uh, incorporate um, corporations and other entities, but we're more on the licensing side. So before we provide uh, um, the, the necessary licenses, uh, let's say for, for example, e-money license or virtual asset service provider license. We really, uh, we, we work within the, the 40B um, committed timeline, given that all documents are correct and complete. Um, but we're really uh, taking a look at the business model. Who are the people behind this? Um, as mentioned by Ms. Amor, you really need to know who these people are because they're not just dealing with um, investor money. They're dealing with the, the money of, of people, the general public, who would place uh, their hard-earned money in, in the systems of these institutions. So um, in the case of what happened with Wirecard um, involving the two banks, so um, unfortunately, I can't also um, go into the details of that, but, but um, what I would want to highlight um, and I agree with uh, Ms. Amor that actually cyber attacks uh, is really um, not a matter or not a question of if, but really when. So what we're 
were um, part of our uh, supervisory and uh, regulatory approach with our supervised institutions is to really enforce um, um, their adoption of cyber resilience and operational resilience because these things will happen to them eventually. Um, and in terms of the scale, um, it, it may range from a small scale cyber attack to a really wide scale cyber attack that may impact uh, the, the entire financial system, right? But um, so, so, which is why we would want them to really have this uh, resiliency mindset and not just a mindset, but really preparing their infrastructures, their processes, uh, uh, and of course, their, their people in supporting this uh, resilience strategy. So, um, and um, probably just to, to um, end with uh, my response is, um, we, we also um, launched um, a campaign series. Um, uh, this was uh, in partnership with USAID. So the BSP launched the hashtag uh, eSafety is everyone's responsibility campaign. So again, um, as regulators, we have our own roles um, um, to, to play in this um, digital financial landscape. And we're also expecting um, some of the you know, significant uh, role to be played also by our supervised institutions, um, such as banks. So uh, they need to, to really have a, a robust uh, risk management framework and systems and processes in place. Uh, they need to follow standards and policies. But of course, we would also want uh, to engage the consumers, the public, to also uh, be aware of their digital identity. Because as I've mentioned earlier, we're really going towards that. We're actually there. And we're really, uh, the, tra the trajectory is really, you know, an uptake into the digital space. So um, as early as now, we have to learn to protect our digital identity. So again, hashtag eSafety is everyone's responsibility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shovelin. We Before we go to the next question, let's take a look at the results of our poll. Uh, Gwen, could you please flash the results of our poll on the question, which of uh, the following FinTech services do you frequently use? Okay, so 32. Um, um, most of our uh, participants are using mobile payment and wallet. Okay, uh, next one it is mobile banking, but no, uh, no response. Uh, we got zero for the rest of the uh, uh, fintech services such as digital lending and credit, uh, trading and cryptocurrency and remittance. Okay, perhaps there's a need for uh, more information uh, dissemination campaign on, on other uh, fintech services and make this more available to uh, Filipinos. Okay, so as I've said, we will, uh, as a token of our appreciation, we will uh, randomly pick two uh, names, okay, from our WebEx uh, participants and Facebook participants who participated in our poll. Okay, so let's, um, we have a few minutes left, so let's have um, entertain other questions. Okay, we have a question here from... Uh, Vicente Camillon, well, this is a general one, but it's very important. How can FinTech contribute uh, to poverty alleviation? Well, I think we can relate this to uh, uh, financial inclusion. Jovi mentioned in, in her uh, presentation about how digital transformation can advance uh, financial inclusion, which could benefit the marginalized sectors by providing them access to uh, financial services. Perhaps our... Uh, is Sheila? Yes, uh, go ahead, uh, Ms. Amor. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to chime in on that. No? Um, yes, please. Okay, but instead of the generality, I wanted to make the, the call a little bit more granular no, mm -hmm. and, and concrete. Um, what will truly, because uh, unfortunately, and I'll, and I'll share this with Ma'am Jovi, because... The BSP has made the advocacy of financial inclusion so pervasive that unfortunately for some institutions, it's become the new greenwashing. So in Diba, ma'am, hashtag, who got again? 
point being, um, this is not just a function of coming up with a campaign or a tagline, um, but rather we need to take concrete steps. That's why for us, and this is something that we will ask the BSP, specifically the Office of uh, Director Mel and Ma'am Jovi, to take a look at, is the importance of an API marketplace. No? Because what an API does is it allows, for example, a Tawi Tawi coffee grower to be able to get plugged in to a financial service, even if there is no banking legacy institution there, or the ability of a Tawi Tawi coffee grower to be plugged in to a procurement marketplace in the region that is properly vetted by regulators. APIs, in a, in a nutshell, is for me, I'm, I don't want to get, I don't want to get philosophical about this, right? But APIs are your irrevocable and inalienable right to do business with anyone you, you want to do business with. Okay, safely and securely. More importantly, it gives the power back to the people. In other words, I can choose who to give or not give my information to. I can probably just to give portions of my information to. And guys, you cannot sign it away just because someone gave you a free umbrella or a free insurance or a raffle. <coughs> so... <coughs> We need to get more granular. What do we need to do to achieve financial institution, uh, f financial inclusion and poverty alleviation? FinTech is not enough. We need to have the right kind of infrastructure within this FinTech ecosystem to tr truly achieve that. No? And for me, one of the things that we really fight for um, is to make sure that we're all connected in an API economy. And those without APIs, we will capacitate them at least for the initial cohort of the MSMEs with a free one that is up to the standards that will be um, acceptable to both, say, the BSP and also the MAS. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Moore. Sorry to geek out. Uh, sorry it's to fine. geek out a bit. It's fine, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Kevin, okay, may I share, share a story? Yes, Kevin, would you like to contribute to this question, please? Yeah, thank you. So um, before we started Plantina, then uh, we just uh, talked to people on the street, asked them what their financial challenges were. Uh, one of these people was a woman selling soda on the street median in Binondo. Um, she's there selling soda with her entire family, her husband, her two-year-old, uh, two-month-old in a crib um, on the street median. I asked her, in your wildest dreams, what do you see yourself doing in five years? And she tells me, and she starts to smile as she stares off into the into the horizon, um, that she's she owns a department store in Singapore, and she's and her entire family is doing well, and um, she's also um, borrowing money from a five six lender in order to buy inventory at Pure Gold and resell it on on the street median. So, you know, those dreams aren't going to be realized anytime soon with that financial situation. You know, how can we do better for, uh, for, for this woman? It's one of, the, one of the things that we like to think about, you know, how can, we, how can our, our borrowers achieve their dreams with, with better lending? You know, lending is a tool. Um, it can be used for good and bad. Um, it's good when we give working capital to, to small businesses, when students can, you know, Get an education. It's bad when it's bad for the borrower when they get put into deeper debt cycles. So um, let's let's all figure this out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Very well said. Okay, let this be our last question. Sheila, let me just uh, yes, add please. one more thing. Um, sure, maybe sure, no problem. Very quickly, um, because we, you know, we we've, we've done a study also on 
a digital divide uh, mm -hmm. for for in the previous uh, year, um, years now, uh, I think two years ago. But uh, what we learned there is that there are two uh, foundational things that would uh, assist technology in order for it to be poverty alleviating. First is you need to, to address the foundation of infrastructure. You no, know, the, the, these people uh, people who don't have access to their mobile a uh, mobile phone and all these things. So, so that's very foundational. But another very foundational thing is that you need to address the culture, the 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 mentality divide, the psychology of of borrowing, the psychology of uh, using technology and addressing the fear of um you know not transacting with a human person but uh, transacting with uh online so you you also need to address these things so um the potential for uh, uh for we've heard the potential no from uh, our two discussions very and I, i'm very supportive of that um extending um credit and uh, providing uh, opportunities to msmes um, but on, on the other hand, uh, there are some hurdles and obstacles that need to be addressed you know, for, for it to be poverty alleviating. So you need to address the motivational uh, motivational barriers and also the infrastructure or the physical barriers. Two things that need to be, that go hand in hand in order for fintech to, address, to become poverty alleviating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. Okay, let's entertain as our last question a com um, Okay, a query from uh, one of our Facebook viewers, and this one is from Phil da Daquila. Phil Daquila. Okay, do universities review their curriculum to incorporate modules, subjects on the formation of startups? Um, okay, I saw Edie Maklang giving us a thumbs up. So, me some more. Yes, uh, very quickly. One of the things that we're doing is uh, there's never really been a good assessment of the current curriculum. And uh, ed EdTech is one of the priority areas in Digital Pilipinas. And um, within Q2, early part of Q2, we are doing um, a curriculum review. It's in partnership with the uh, Mapua um Educational System, Digital Pilipinas, and our co-conveners. Our co-conveners are Globe, Gcash, Union Bank, Coins.ph, right? Uh, Branca, some of the largest players in fintech. Mm -hmm. Send it. We have two unicorns, yay. Um, what we're doing is finding a way to review not just the curriculum and then bounce it back with Ched and uh, those who are designing it. Uh, so that it can be more oriented, not necessarily just for fintech, but Web 3.0 in general. Uh, so, right, yeah. so yes, the, the question is, we really have we really have a horrible divide between industry and academe, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the appetite for four year courses, one year courses, even it it it's it's dissipated, right? So mm -hmm. we need to revisit how we deliver the payload that is education in a manner that is still certifiable, immutable, but appreciated in small chunks by our current market. So yes, yeah, so the answer is no, there isn't, but yes, something is being done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa Moore. And it's important that we institutionalize, institution, institutionalize this effort it, uh, we can't just rely on one university um, in partnership with Digital Filipinas and other uh, industry actors doing this. It can't be just Mapua. So, yeah, and uh, it's, it's good that you are linking with uh, the CHED, the Commission on Higher Education. Hopefully, this will be a, you know, be done also in uh, by other uh, universities, other higher education institutions. Would any of our, well, uh, Kevin has, um, you know, touched on um, education in his, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, presentation. So, okay, just to wrap up our discussion. Yeah, I could, I could share, share some extra thoughts there. Yes, please, that, please do. Yeah, thanks. So, so there, there's, there's Chad, there's the universities, and there's also um, the culture that we promote amongst our youths in mm. just, empowering them with the 
with the boldness to take their own independent steps towards their education. If they feel passionate about learning this technology, the internet is rife with, uh, with, with resources for that. And we just, you know, I'd love to be able to encourage people to just give themselves the permission to, 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 to take that step and, and, and learn that. The challenge there is that um, there is some hesitance to step away from that bureaucracy and that, mm -hmm. You know, students are asking themselves, if I spend time on this, how am I going to get any class credit for it? How is this going to contribute to this degree that I've been that I've invested in? And, um, you know, there's so much that we can learn outside of the university, you know, the, you know, you know, classroom that you learn on the job, that you learn from building things or failing, you know, uh, in, in the process. And so, um, yeah, you know, happy to to, you know, chat with with uh, the powers that be to uh, to figure out how we can uh, instill that sense of uh, of independence. Thank you very much, Kevin. Hey, friends, uh, to cap our discussion, may I ask each speaker for um, their brief final remarks? Um, starting off with uh, Francis, any uh, yeah. Any final? Thank you, yes, please. I, let me just echo one one. Um, uh, I, I think Ms. Jovi was the one who mentioned this. She said that the sector is very dynamic. And uh, I, and I, I echo this because every time I open the internet and I look for news and I read news, it's almost everything is on FinTech. Echoing also what um, uh, E.D. Maklang has mentioned that uh, FinTech with, uh, with um, retail is e-commerce, then you have ed tech, you have health tech. You have everything is related to technology these days, and the potential is really very high. So, um, one and uh, for me, I'm I'm a student. So right now, I'm still a student. I'm still learning this very dynamic sector, and there's a lot of research that needs to be done. So I myself cannot do this alone. So. I really encourage a lot of people to also go into studying this sector and try to support the the research needs of of, of this sector. And um, uh, Kevin has uh, has uh, mentioned something that I think I will pursue in in the few if I have time. No, so um, computer science graduates that can actually build startups. So this one is something that. Uh, and also something that he mentioned is to make sure that grants that don't add red tape. So not just giving out grants, but to make sure that these are the grants that would actually make it easier for, for our fintechs and startups to, to actually grow and not, not be an additional burden. So yeah, um, these two things, no? so that might be a good uh, research uh, in the future. So yeah, that's, that's my final word. Uh, let's, let's keep on studying and learning about this um, very dynamic industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. And uh, thanks again for your presentation uh, this afternoon and looking forward to more uh, research from you on FinTech and other um, other uh, um, studies related to innovation and technology. Okay, so um, Mr. Kevin Gabayan, um, your final word, sir. Um, yes, uh, you know, the, you know, use in the Philippines, um, you know, please give yourself the permission to try, uh, the permission to fail, and, uh, and we, and, and you're our heroes uh, for, for doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Ms. Amo Maklang, final word, ma'am. You may want to uh, add to uh, what you have uh, discussed uh, a while ago, your brief final remarks. Absolutely. Um, I've, I've, I've said it a lot of times, but um, there's never been a better time to be a Filipino, to be a technologist, and to be in fintech. Uh, and um, if several generations ago we've seen an exodus of the best and brightest to the rest of the world of Filipinos, the reverse is true, um, as evinced, for example, by people like Kevin, who have chosen to repatriate themselves back mm -hmm. to the country. And in the process, what this is doing is really putting us 
at front and center of this fintech revolution in the world. Um, given the amazing enabling ecosystem that has been led by the BSP. So shout out, we're obviously such big fans. Um, but more importantly, by the effusive talent that's flying to the Philippines. Despite the narrative being exciting and advanced, there's still so much work being done. I looked at the poll and I was stunned that 60% are not using any type of, uh, you know, any type of, um, uh, any type of financial technology. I mean, going into here, we were all riding high and uh, perhaps getting drunk in our own narrative about, um, the excitement in fintech, and but the, the truth of the matter is, there's still a lot of work that needs to get done. And the only way we can do it is if we unrelentingly work closely together. And this is a call uh, to anyone who'd like to help build the digital Pilipinas for us. Please do let me know. I'm going to leave my information on the chat. At mabuhay po tayong lahat, mabuhay po ang Pilipinas. Salamat. Maraming salamat. Maraming maraming salamat, Ms. Amor Maklang of Digital Pilipinas. And thank you also for the great work that Fintech Philippines Association is doing. And of course, Kevin, salamat. Thank you very much uh, for all the good work that uh, your uh, plantina has been, has been doing. You have... Um, you know, you have moved out of your comfort zone in the United States to uh, go back to the Philippines and serve your country. And of course, Jovi, last but not, definitely not the least, may we hear your last word. Yeah, it's hard to go go last for for the <laughs> words, but um, maybe what I can share is that um, digital is here and now. And the sooner we um accept that and really you know take that into full consideration um we would be able to have that um fresh perspective and mindset in terms of adapting to to a digital environment and um hopefully in in that as in that process uh, of adapting to this new digital environment um we also um put emphasis in terms of um, helping out uh, the, the underserved and the unbanked uh, sector um, to all, for also, um, you know, for, for FinTech to be um, the enabler for them to, to get out of that uh, poverty and um, um, being disadvantaged in terms of their uh, access to the financial system. So hopefully, um, through the power of fintech and and you know these uh, innovative and emerging technologies, all of us, um, not only uh, you know the select few, but all of us would be able to take full advantage of these technologies. So thank you so much for um, inviting the BSP, um, and we really appreciate your um, the discussion paper that uh, was put out by PIDS. And thank you very much, Jovi, and hats off to uh, the Banco Central for uh, all its initiatives. Maraming salamat, BSP. Okay, friends, so at this point, please join me in thanking our paper authors led by Dr. Francis Kimba and, of course, our panel of reactors, Mr. Kevin Gabayan, the CEO of Plantina, Ms. Amo Maklang, the Executive Director of Fintech uh, Philippines Association, and Ms. Jovelin Howe, Head of BSP's BSP's uh, FinTech uh, Innovation and Policy Research Group. Let us give all of them a big virtual clap. Okay, so before we finally close, can we have a group photo, Gwen? Yes. Okay, um, let me just take a few shots. Edie Maklang. Hi. Okay. All right. Um... Okay, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much, Gwen. And at this point, let me announce the winners of our poll. From WebEx, we have um, Karin Eltagon and Melanie Garcia. Karin Eltagon and Melanie Garcia. And from Facebook, 
Lumi, Lumawi, and Lia or Lea Lobrera. From Facebook, Louis Lumawig and Lea Lobrera, our uh, the webinar team of PIDS will get in touch with you for your prize. Okay, and finally, we have some reminders. Okay, so friends, you can down you can access all the presentations from today's webinar from the PIDS website. Um, flash on the screen is um, the uh, link to our seminar page and also the link to the full study and we will also upload the presentations of our reactors and please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after after uh, this webinar we will also email you the link after the event your comments are important to us to improve our um, webinars and to serve you better and please uh, regularly visit our website and social media pages um please we have a youtube channel we have a twitter page and of course our website and our facebook page so thank you to all those um who um watch the live stream of this webinar on facebook and those who tune in to our twitter account for the live updates okay and for our webinars in march um we have three on march 3 we will have the topic on um Ass assessing the cri criteria used in determining LGU uh, fiscal viability. This webinar is in uh, collaboration with uh, the House of Representatives um, CPDRD or Congressional Planning and uh, Budget Research Department. And then on March 10, we have a webinar on boosting the Philippines participation in services trade agreements. And on March 17, we have examining the readiness of Philippine cities to smart city development. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. So friends, this concludes our webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you on March 3. Maraming salamat po.